learn about politics and make decisions about what they think about politics. And I'm going to start by positing kind of a profound question. Will President Biden be successful? This is about domestic policy. And if you care anything about American politics, and if you're on this call, I assume you do, this has to be something that's on your mind. Will President Biden succeed in his agenda? And if you support him or not, this is important. If you support the president, you generally believe his policies are good for America and maybe the world, and you want to see him succeed. If you oppose him, you want to see him fail because you think that's better. So how do if he's going to be successful. Um, generally in politics, we assume that political capital is what's important to presidential success, that popular presidents are able to get their uh, agenda accomplished. And they do this because they're influential. So if a president is considered to be popular, usually we talk about this, that a majority of the population approves of their job in office, that president can then go to members of Congress, typically in their party, but sometimes others, and convince them to support their legislative agenda. And they do this by saying, if you support me, I will support you for re-election. And this tends to be influential. So presidential approval is critically important for policy development. So how well is Biden doing? If you're a political junkie like I am, you're probably familiar with figures like this, which is President Biden's approval ratings over time. When he came into office, he was doing pretty well. Uh, a 55% approval rating is rather typical for a president coming into office, but it's not fantastic. Uh, president Biden was able to maintain this for about six months until he recently started losing his popularity. And this suggests that he's losing his sway with legislators and it might be harder to get his agenda moving. So does this mean his presidency is over? Well, not necessarily. Uh, it is still possible for the president to accomplish things without going through Congress, but we can turn to the prior president to see how successful that can be. Uh, these are President Trump's approval ratings, and he had a very different experience in the presidency. When he came into the office, President Trump was below 50%. Within weeks of being president, he fell what we call underwater. More people disapproved of President Trump than approved of him. And if you look at President Trump's ability to succeed in implementing his agenda during his presidency, it was not very good. Uh, whether you're a supporter or an opponent of President Trump, his major accomplishments that will last the test of time are rather limited. Uh, the one legislative success he really had was the 2017 tax cut. And other than that, not much legislation got through. And this was because the president didn't have the cachet, both with his party and with the opposing party, to persuade people to work with. And I think this is not just something that's localized to President Trump or President Biden. This is a new phenomenon in American politics. And there are a lot of contemporary factors that work against presidents in developing their domestic agenda. The first of which is the nationalization of politics. Uh, if you go back 30 years ago, your average American citizen got a local newspaper, they had regional television channels they paid attention to, and they also maybe got a national level newspaper or watched national media. But their daily diet of information had a range of different focuses. So people were well informed about what happened in their town, in their state, and at the national level. Well, that's all gone now. Uh, local level media in the United States has been dying out for 30 years, really with the advent of the internet. And right now, most media in the United States focuses on national issues. So people don't hear about how their local town's economy is doing. They only hear about the national economy now. They only hear about national level issues. And this means there's a lot of pressure on the president. Presidents can't just kind of skate by un- uh, without people paying attention to it. Every day, people in America hear about these national level issues and they believe the president is intimately involved in resolving them. Uh, and while this is happening, the party that's not in power just criticizes. They constantly point to what is wrong with the president's policies, uh, which is a new factor in American politics. We have not seen this uh, homogenous diet of national level information before, and it's changed things. And one of the things we've noticed over the last 30 years 
is that people are suddenly developing a stronger political identity. So an identity, an identity is simply an understanding of who you are and what you think is important, what you care about. And politically, identity used to be rather weak in the United States. Uh, and this is because it was localized around elections. People largely ignored politics when an election wasn't happening. And as an election got closer, people would focus on candidates and learn more about politics and they'd care more. Well, those days are gone. Now, people pay attention to politics on an almost daily basis, on an almost hourly basis. Uh, there's this phenomenon that we call the centralization of political identity, that people across the United States are intensely focused on politics. And because of the nationalization, it's national level politics that people are focusing. And we know there are some reasons behind this. Uh, for 50 years now, there has been a very stable ideological sorting of the electorate where people have learned which party they belong in. If you go back to the 1960s, you had conservative Democrats and liberal Republicans, and there was a lot of diversity within the parties, which meant that two Democrats could sit down and have an ideological argument and learn from each other because they respected each other. They were from the same party. So they could have these diverse discussions about policy development and what would be good for the country. Well, that's gone. Now, if you are a liberal in America, you are in the Democratic Party. If you're a conservative, you're in the Republican Party. And if you're a moderate, frankly, you're told you can't be. You have to choose a camp because there's no home for moderation anymore. On top of this, the media has changed. In the last 30 years, the media has become partisan. Uh, 1996, Fox News Channel opened its doors and immediately said, we are the source for conservative information in America. And if you're listening to anybody else, they're liberal. So if you're a conservative, you have to come to us for your information. They've been very successful at this. Uh, all conservatives in America practically turn to Fox News as a key source of information. And this means that every day when they tune in, they hear the message of the day from their party. And that message is never going to be supportive of a democratic president. Similarly, the mainstream media has gone in the other way. Since they've lost the conservative audience, they've started catering to a more liberal audience and liberals know the sources they should turn to. So every day, Americans now consume a daily diet of largely hearing why their party is good and the other party is bad. And on top of that, we now have social media. And this is very recent. It's only in about the last 10 to 15 years that we have seen people turning to social media, not for information, not for facts that support their beliefs, but to find out who believes what they believe. And this is an environment that can be largely fact-free but it reinforces that whatever you want to believe is supported by others, which creates a very intense sense of identity. People are starting to only hang out and talk to people who already agree with their political perspectives. So what does this mean for policy development? Well, so this is a complicated figure, but I share it to you because it explains a lot about the changes in American politics and policy over the last 30 to 40 years. Uh, and I'll explain this. This top line is a line that shows how Democrats over the years have felt about their party. And the takeaway is for 30 or 40 years, Democrats have always liked their party about the same degree. It doesn't matter who the presidential candidate is. It doesn't matter what the platform is. Democrats like their party. And for Republicans, it's largely the same. For Republicans, uh, it's a little bit below Democrats. It has tailed off over time, but this figure ends at 2016. With the Trump presidency, there has been a rebound is how much Republicans take pride in their own party. And they're now on par with Democrats. So the takeaway here is in 30 or 40 years, both parties pretty much like themselves about as much as they always have. The interesting thing is down here, this line is actually two lines, and these are measuring how Democrats feel about Republicans and how Republicans feel about Democrats. So how you feel about people from the other party. And there is a large change here. Over the past 30 years, we have measured this steady erosion of liking of the other party. 
And it's gotten to the point where it's not just that Democrats don't like Republicans and Republicans don't like Democrats. It's that they hold contempt for each other. That Democrats look down on Republicans as inferior people and Republicans look down at Democrats as unredeemable. And this is what we call the rise of affective polarization. Now, again, this chart ends in 2016. By 2020, these lines were pretty much together. Partisans don't like each other anymore in America, and that has consequences. So with this blended universe, we've entered into what I call the impossible presidency. Uh, public opinion scholars are really interested in what room presidents have to act now because there's a bunch of things we know about how people learn about politics and then react to that information. We know that partisans are always going to remain partisan. Uh, since we've been studying partisanship, we know that Republicans are always likely to vote for Republicans. Democrats are likely to vote for Democrats. There used to be this space during an election cycle where campaigns could change people's minds. Well, that space seems to be ending because now people don't wait till a campaign to filter out information. They're learning about it every day from partisan sources that just reinforces their existing beliefs. So even if President Biden is able to push through major legislation, he's got two major bills that have passed so far. There's one that may pass today, at least through the House. Is it likely to have an effect? Well, not likely, because Fox News is never going to say that this bill is good for America. So Republicans are unlikely to ever get information that would change their mind. We also know that negative information, saying something is bad, is much more powerful than positive information. And this is evolutionary psychology. If you're hungry and go outside and see a bush full of berries, but you also see a tiger, you're probably not going to go for the berries, even though that would make you happy because there's a tiger that would make you less happy. Uh, negative things are always more impactful on our minds. And the world is full of negative information. Uh, people are constantly aware of the negative information about what the president is doing and what's happening in the world because of the president. So one of the things we're seeing is that nonpartisans, people who don't have strong party preferences, are tending to turn away from the president during their time in office. We've seen this with President Bush, President Obama, President Trump, and President Biden. It's just a matter of how quickly it tends to happen. Uh, and as people turn away, they tend to turn towards the other party who presents an alternative. Uh, and the sum here is that a lot of this is due to the modern information environment, that we're still living in a world where people are trying to learn about politics, but it's no longer just an occasional act. It's something that's happening on a daily basis. And because of the sources of information we have access to today, we tend to make the same decisions over and over and over again. And the only way out of this is typically a crisis that is of extreme scope that for forces us to focus not on the news information we're seeing online and on TV, but in our daily lives. And if you think about the timeline here, uh, we've gone through the 2008 financial collapse. We've gone through recently the COVID pandemic. And these have not been large enough. So it's very doubtful uh, that another crisis is going to come that could shake this. Uh, so net sum is the policy future in America is a little bleak because it's unlikely that a large majority will emerge that allows the president to act and really fully uh, implement their agenda. All right, that is all I have for today. Thank you for listening. And I will turn it over to Laura. Thank you so much for that fascinating and insightful presentation, Professor Anderson. We really appreciate it. Just a reminder to our audience, any questions you may have, we've got a Q&A function, which is fantastic. Please put them in whenever they occur to you. We really look forward uh, to hearing uh, all of your questions and taking as many as possible. So with that, I hand over to our other expert, uh, Emeritus Fellow of Lady Margaret Hall, University of Oxford, Gillian Peel. Sorry, Jillian, I think you're muted. Okay, right, can you hear me now? Perfect. Okay, um, well, I want to pick up on um, David's excellent uh, introduction. He was focusing, I think, very much on the impossible presidency and on um, the strengthening of 
uh, political identity and some of the implications for American politics. And I want very briefly in, my, in the time available to say that I think the situation is much more serious than that. It's not just that presidential government has become very difficult, but I think that the United States has entered a period where its constitutional arrangements, its civic culture, um, indeed the very uh, viability of governance are under threat. And I think this is a very frightening um, uh, situation in, in many respects. Um, I want to go back, of course, to what we will all remember very vividly, the um, uh, January the 6th uh, invasion of the capital. And I suppose that the events surrounding that were as close, perhaps, as the um, United States has in recent times come to a coup. Um, and I think the United States has, in a very peculiar way, still not reconciled itself, and really got to grips with what was going on there. Um, I think what we did see in that episode were a number of developments which, by and large, uh, reflect changes on the American right. And uh, I think David's focus was very much on where we are with, with both parties. I want to talk a little bit about what's been happening on the American right, uh, painting a very broad brush for the moment because we can take up some of the issues uh, at question time. Um, and I think the point I want to make is that there has been a massive transformation of the American right uh, in the period since, and I date it back to probably 20, uh, 2008 to the um, beginning of the Obama presidency, but um, many of the developments uh, probably have a longer origin than that. But we've seen, I think, changes that make the Republican Party, as part of that broader right-wing coalition, um, a very difficult um, party to negotiate with. I think it's moved the Republican Party into a position where any kind of consensus or um, bipartisan negotiation uh, is going to be difficult. And I think it raises a lot of questions about the extent to which the American two-party system um, is really, I wouldn't say it isn't viable because clearly both parties are still there, but what the impact is on the ability of American governmental institutions to work. So let me just say a couple of words about what I see as having happened uh, on the American right and why it's so important. Um, obviously, the advent of Trump to the presidency in 2016 was a major change because here we had someone who was, and we should never forget this, um, regarded with disdain um, by many members of the Republican Party. He was an outsider. He was somebody who had no, um, no governmental experience. He was someone who um, uh, had a very limited relationship with uh, the truth. He was totally cynical, I think, in many respects about um, policy making. He was not interested in the nuts and bolts of governance. And yet he had this very, uh, very, very dramatic ability to connect with a certain section of the American electorate. And once the Republican Party had decided that he was a winner, to effectively um, capture and transform the Republican Party. Um, there were certain other, of course, obvious features of Trump's presidency, which I'm sure we want to discuss in more detail. But the most corrosive, I think, uh, of those um, features was his um, determination to emphasize, and this goes back, of course, to something that, that uh, the thrust of David's talk, to emphasize divisions in the American political system and to uh, emphasize uh, identities which he thought would um, play into the Republican um, uh, base. So of course the racial issues were um, uh, highlighted, um, his support for um, a certain vision of the American um, uh, founding uh, 
uh, of American history, a kind of cultural Christian nationalism. Um, all of these factors um, made, I think, at the end of his presidency, the United States an even more divided place than it had been uh, in 2016. Now, if we actually think about um, the, the brought not the Republican Party as such, which I'll come back to in a minute, but the um, broader coalition uh, or conservative coalition, which has become a, a fairly um, significant feature of American politics, certainly since the Reagan era, uh, since, since the uh, advent of Reagan. I think what we can see, we can see certain things changing in that coalition. I think the first thing is that there's very little emphasis on ideology as such, or at least on ideas. Um, all the think tanks that were part of the uh, conservative revival in the 1970s and 80s, um, they're still operative. But I think the, the dynamic of Republican um, uh, politics has shifted to a much more uh, visceral um, kind of politics. It's not about debating ideas. It's about uh, debating emotions. Um, there was apparent, obviously, in the January 6th uh, coup, but it had been apparent um, long before then, a strengthening of extremist uh, militant elements on the right, which Trump, of course, gave um, some legitimacy to. Um, Proud Boys um, uh, being just one example uh, of that. But um, many parts of the United States, I think, uh, experienced um, visible uh, demonstrations by um, armed militia groups, um, which uh, is, I think, a, it's, not, it's not a totally new development, but I think they, they all regarded themselves as strengthened by the Trump presidency. And of course, social media gave them a dark space to, a dark place to make contact with each other. Um, the religious right, which backed Trump rather bizarrely, given his uh, own lack of religious belief uh, and his very um, uh, interesting lifestyle. Um, the religious right has, I think, um, become much more, uh, much closer to uh, a kind of Christian nationalist um, movement. Um, we've seen the growth, so it's quite small at the moment, of so-called patriot churches. Um, and I think that what, what we can see happening on the right is a, a very strong religious right, a strong assertion of Christian cultural values, um, a lack of interest or support for ecumenism, a more, more extreme approach to um, uh, issues like uh, abortion. And I think um, to the extent that the religious uh, right is in many respects uh, slightly declining in numbers, a, a much greater feeling of being embattled. Um, I think if we look at the Republican Party itself, um, which has obviously been captured uh, by Trumpism to an extent that I think many would not have predicted in 20, 2016, we can see that um, there are some very extreme uh, elements in the Republican Party in Congress, which um, only this week we've seen a sort of censure of one of them for showing fairly violent uh, videos. Um, we've seen people um, like Marjorie Taylor Greene, um, people uh, who are, I think, would, would, would not have been tolerated in the Republican Party 15 years ago. And these people are there, and I think they are, um, in a sense, not not going to disappear. They are. They are. They see themselves as a very legitimate part of the Republican Party. I think the other point that I would make, um, which uh, I mean, David sort of hinted at, is that underlying this, there is a retreat from what I would call reason or rational debate. 
One of the features which again uh, was very evident in the um, uh, January the 6th um, uh, invasion of the capital was the um, presence of supporters of QAnon, of, of conspiracy theory. But um, the tendency to see that as a kind of an eccentric fringe is uh, misguided that, that actually a very large number, I, I think, of American uh, voters now believe in various forms of conspiracy theory, and many more are rejecting, uh, or uh, perhaps because of religious belief, perhaps because um, lack of education, I don't know, but re rejecting what I would call scientific-based explanations of the universe, that they are looking for some kind of conspiracy to explain uh, the dynamics and the uh, process of politics. So I think we've got different mindsets in the United States. We've got a, a new extremism, which uh, obviously can result in violence. We've got uh, cultural um, divisions of a very uh, extreme sort. And we've got a party uh, in Congress. I'm not saying that it's, it's only the Republican Party that has extreme elements. But I think the, um, the Republican Party uh, is having trouble um, handling, managing some of its more extreme elements. So what are the consequences of this? I could, you know, we can pick up on many of these points. I mean, I think the capture of the Republican Party by Trump uh, or Trumpism, because it may be that Trump himself will decide not to run, but then there'll surely be a Trump lookalike um, who will try and um, combine some of the features of Trump with um, perhaps a rather diff slightly different kind of um, set of ideas. I think, I think that sets a new style in uh, American politics, a very personal, um, much more um, demagogic style. I mean, America is not unfamiliar with demagogues, uh, but this, this, I think, is a new development, partly because of the points that, that David uh, has raised and that certainly Phil has written about in the past, um, the new media environment. Um, so I think it's going to be very difficult for anyone who wants to step outside that kind of style to um, be successful in getting uh, the, uh, the Republican nomination uh, in 2024. I think we've seen, and this was, of course, the whole thrust of the rejection of the electoral results, the notion that it was a steal, a rejection and an alienation to an extent I've never seen before uh, of the United States institutional arrangements, um, not, of course, for the whole country, but a substantial minority feeling that somehow the democracy isn't working. When you add to that um, the... Um, uh, the fact that governance has long been identified as a, as a problem in a, in a deadlocked and, and polarized uh, political system, the fact that it looks as though it's going to be difficult to, for any president perhaps to develop a policy agenda, uh, I think it won't, it's hardly going to be surprising that you're going to get an alienated, if you get an alienated electorate. And I think finally, um, I don't see how, given the incentive uh, for the parties to develop and capitalize on the social divisions, which uh, clearly there are in the United States, uh, identity politics, uh, how you get back from that to a different, much more consensual style of uh, political uh, engagement and um, encounter. So I suppose my message is really rather gloomy that I think that this, um, this movement, uh, that probably the right from the late 1970s onwards was the key factor in driving some of these um, developments. But I think it's going to be very difficult indeed to um, uh, stop uh, them having 
very serious consequences for the for the stability of American democratic life. OK, I'll stop there and people can I, I'm sure, pick up on a lot of those points, which I hope have been relatively controversial. Oh, and there's a lot for us to dig into. Maybe even we can find some optimism somewhere in the questions. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with, we've received a couple of questions in the chat. If people could put them in the Q&A, that would be really helpful. We've got a couple coming in there as well. So that's fantastic. So I'm just going to start with the ones in the chat and then I'm going to flip over to the Q&A function. So mm -hmm. to start with Elizabeth Grant, um, I don't know whether your microphone is working, if you would like to uh, verbalize your question, you could tell me if, oh yeah, there you are, I can see you. Um, please go ahead and ask your question. So do you, want us, do you want us to just go ahead and have a... No, 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 I'm just seeing if we can, if, if Elizabeth can... Uh, if we can hear her. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna read out a question and and Elizabeth can scream if if <laughs> if we're able to hear her. Um, she writes. This is a question for Professor Anderson. Following his very interesting presentation, the issue of a crisis being the only way out. Does he think that the undeniable physical impact of climate change can make some headway? in assessing which president offers the best path forward. Also, passing the infrastructure bill will certainly address experience on the ground. And she thanks you both very much. So yes, I, uh, I intentionally try not to be so down on American politics, but the reality is bleak. Uh, exactly as Jillian was saying, America is at a crossroads on whether it continued to function as a democratic society. Uh, and I would agree that it is largely in the hands of the Republican Party to change this. Uh, I do believe that throughout American history, it's been crisis that brings the country together and crisis usually forces reality to take hold. And usually polarization doesn't go away, but one side uh, assumes superiority, numeric superiority over the other. Um, and I think that that is inevitably what the country needs right now, which is a horrible thing to hope for. Uh, in the last 20 years, the United States has faced major uh, terrorist attacks that has refocused the country's attention to defending its borders. Uh, it faced a financial collapse in 2008. It faced the pandemic. And none of these were capable of overcoming partisan politics in the United States. So if those aren't sufficient, what will be? Uh, climate change is a good candidate. That if climate change ramps up as we expect it will, uh, the big worry for the United States is that when rainfall patterns shift and farmland in the Midwest is no longer viable, there's nowhere to move that food production. And this could quite honestly lead to uh, starvation in the United States and around the world because the United States produces so much food. Uh, that might do it, except the Republican Party has taken a hard stance that climate change is not happening. If it is happening, it's not the fault of human beings. And if it is the fault of human beings, there's nothing we can do about it. And if there is something we can do about it, it would destroy the economy so we can't even talk about it. So something apocalyptic in nature would be necessary, I think, to shake them out of this. And thinking about this, just brainstorming it, I think is a pathway to a horror show. Uh, the size of the cataclysm that would need to shake Republican Party politics to accept, as Jillian said, basic science about what to do about the problems of America. Thank you for that. I think <laughs> apocalyptic message, um, but your honesty and your insight is 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 really fascinating. And uh, I think we could debate for a long time. This question came up. Uh, one of the, the A level students actually was uh, really uh, an insightful question about this idea of bipartisanship a crisis that that you're talking about. And uh, I, I tried to put a positive spin, saying that well, we must remember that, for example, the Great Depression 
uh, didn't bring people together. There was always that contention over the New Deal and things like that. Um, I think we could debate for a long time about how long 9-11 brought people together uh, before it all sort of uh, disintegrated into different partisan groups. But um, that's not for me to say. Uh, I, I'm going to pass over to uh, Richard Johnson. Richard, it's, it's great to see you again virtually. Um, I don't know whether you're able to uh, ask your question if your microphone is working. I know you've got another question for David. Okay, I'm going to read it out. Um, Mia Costa's recent article, Ideology Not Affect, AJPS, found that voters were actually less favorable toward candidates who made negative partisan appeals, i.e. the other party is corrupt, immoral, evil, and more favorable to those who use positive partisan messaging, i.e. our party is great. So wouldn't it seem that while negative partisan appeals are probably more powerful than they once were, it's still the case that there's a lot of room for positive partisan messaging. In other words, Biden could still go high even if the other side goes low. I like that shout out. Well, I'm unfortunately not familiar with the article, so it's hard for me to address it in specific, but in general, I would say there may be room for a positive appeal and there is a lot of information, there's a lot of research on the campaigning side that says you can't just attack your opponent. You have to offer something in return. But attacking your opponent is a really good strategy. Uh, almost every campaign in America right now is intensely negative because we know that particularly for people with weak partisan predispositions, that negative information matters more than the positive information. Positive information gives reason to people, gives people a reason to come out and vote for you. And you need to do that to win an election. But the negative information gives them a reason to listen to you. Uh, usually when people hear negative information, it makes, it makes them think more. Uh, all of us get anxious when we hear scary negative things and our reaction to anxiety is to try to learn more. We try to learn more about what's happening in the world and that's where a positive message works. So I don't know the specific article, but I would say both are important. Um, I do think the negative information still remains dominant in its impact on political beliefs. Unfortunately. Can I just have one thing though? Um, it seems to me that once negative, a negative message has got across, it's very hard to overcome that. So therefore, if you've got somebody stereotyped, and the example that's springing to mind now is of course the vice president, that once you've got an image that and a vulnerability that you can attack, you go on attacking. It's then very hard for for to to insert some positive um, uh, messaging into that. So I think, of course, there's both positive and negative messaging, and I think Biden's positives will go up. But I think the negative um, uh, tendency uh, in campaigns is the dominant one. And if I can, I would just add to that, because I think that's a great observation. Um, and I think one of the big problems in American politics today is that it is very professional and campaigns are not just run by amateurs anymore. It's a professional oper operation and people know the science of decision making now. And one of the things the Republican Party learned first in the early 2000s is the most effective negative information does not need to be true. It needs to address <laughs> the strengths of your opponent. So immediately hit back with Biden's infrastructure plan and say it's ineffective, it's wasteful, uh, these Is roads inflation? fall apart. Mm -hmm. And that way, when positive information comes out, people are confused. They've heard both sides. So the positive kind of gets discarded. And you say, well, there's still doubt. Uh, and it's not a fair fight, unfortunately. All right, um, we have another question for Elizabeth this time, it's for Jillian. So I'm hoping we might be able to hear her and if not, I can absolutely uh, be able to uh, read out her question for her. Uh, let's give it another go. I can see you're unmuted, uh, Liz. I just, we can't hear you for some reason. Um, not quite sure why that is. Uh, technology is great when it works. <laughs> Okay, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna read out your your question for Professor Peel. Um, 
She says, I personally have ceased calling the Republican Party that name. I refer to it as the new Republican Fascist Party in response to the extremism of media beliefs and paramilitary elements. Do you think that without passing federal laws that supplement the new, quote, Jim Crow style, state laws is America lost? Um, well, that's a very interesting question. I mean, the, the two parts, really. One is about whether it's moved to be a fascist party, the Republican Party. And I think, of course, there are elements, but I'd be a little bit careful about using that word, although there are similarities, particularly the emphasis on the leader and the popular and demogra demagogic style. Um, I think the Jim Crow issue, I mean, we know uh, that uh, Republicans see a threat in voting laws uh, which maximize the electorate and therefore want to restrict it, and that there is a, a kind of uh, play strategy, playbook, that, that they're all going to follow to try to um, uh, limit uh, the uh, the franchise and, and roll back um, access to the ballot. Whether or not federal um, laws could actually work to prevent that, yes, they're going to try, but I don't think they're going to get through, and I think they will be challenged in the Supreme Court. Um, I mean, <laughs> uh, part of the problem that we have at the moment is the rolling back of... Um, uh, sections of the, the Voting Rights Act um, uh, by the Supreme Court, uh, and I don't think there's a majority in Congress to even try and over, over, overturn that. So, And I don't know the, when we will get a majority in the court that would itself um, overturn it. So I think, I think that actually getting any serious law that would remove the state's powers to control of their own voting laws. Um, getting getting any kind of legislation through Congress on that is going to be remarkably different, difficult, particularly if we get a Republican Congress next time, next time round. So um, ultimately, that's the answer, of course. Uh, but um, getting from A to B is going to be very difficult. Thank you so much for that. So we have uh, two questions from Peter. One of them has already been sort of discussed about this idea of crisis. So Peter Gordon, um, if I could invite you, if you would uh, hopefully uh, like to verbalize your question about Trump and the question of charisma, that would be fantastic. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Oh, that's good. Uh, yes, um, I wonder how much of the success of um, of Trump is due to his charisma. I think back to Ronald Reagan, and obviously um, Ronald Reagan wasn't nearly as divisive as Trump, but he was seen as you know the great communicator, and people obviously were um, you know affected by his charisma. Uh, do you think that is the case? And if so, is there any obvious person to follow? For instance, Mike Pence. Well, well, first question is Mike Pence his obvious uh, follow on? Uh, maybe he is, maybe he isn't. Do you think Mike Pence would be able to? get the same sort of following. <laughs> so um, I'll take this. Uh, number one, I don't think Mike Pence is at all going to follow in the footsteps of Donald Trump. Uh, Trump's appeal, at least in part, was due to his charisma and his ability to speak to a class of American voters who felt like nobody was talking to them. And I think we hear about this a lot when there are big political shifts that a candidate came out and he talked to some group that had not been spoken to in a while. And I think what happened with Donald Trump is he forgot all about policy. He had no interest in policy. He did not care about sounding intelligent or <laughs> like he had a plan. He spoke to a segment of America who wanted simple solutions and were really angry about their lot in life. And he blamed everybody else and said, give me power. I'm brilliant. I'm amazing. Don't worry about what I'm going to do. I'm just going to do it because I'm great. And people did not expect this to be successful. And I still believe that if you go back to 2016, there is a series of unfortunate events 
that led to Trump winning the Republican nomination that are just unlikely to ever repeat in history. And then another series of unfortunate events that led to his eventual winning of the presidency. Uh, I think his charisma is a major factor there. I don't think many people could pick it up because it was just too wrapped up in who he was. He was very authentic. Donald Trump is who he is, but he's also a self-funding billionaire who by most accounts never expected to win the nomination and never expected to win the presidency. And very early in the campaign, turns it into a PR push that would help his business and that he could hopefully make some money off of. Uh, and it happened to work. But I don't think it's a model for success for many other candidates. Yeah, could, could I just come in? I think that there is a, I mean, the problem is the term charisma. Um, I mean, I think Reagan had real charisma in the sense that he could communicate. People liked him. He left office uh, with, with a great deal of popularity. He was seen as sunny. I think Trump was seen as a bastard, but he was our bastard to those groups who, who actually uh, felt threatened by um, all sorts of cultural and social uh, and economic development. So your point about the groups um, that he appealed to, absolutely right. What they thought, I think, when they saw Trump was that he wasn't like other politicians, and indeed he wasn't, he would get things done. He would actually deliver on draining the swamp and clearing up the mess and repudiating some of the um, uh, ideas which have become dominant in American politics. So I think the notion of charisma, I mean, we might need a, uh, a sort of some kind of different term, but I think, um, you know, it seems to me that there is a marked difference between Reagan uh, and his, his appeal uh, and that of Trump's. Um, it's a much blacker, much darker kind of appeal that, that Trump had. It's a fascinating discussion, especially considering all the comparisons that Trump tried to make between himself and Reagan. This is mm. not something that he were kept trying on. So it's absolutely fascinating. Thank you so much for that. While we're waiting for some more questions to come into the QA, I'd just like to take the opportunity as chair, an incredibly exciting opportunity, uh, to ask you both as experts, um, we've talked a lot about sort of the pesso pessimism of bipartisanship, how we feel things are going in the sort of year lead up to the midterms. Um, and we've talked a lot about, well, maybe we've touched a little bit about cancel culture as well. And I know David in his presentation, uh, for example, mentioned about almost this self-segregation people putting themselves into echo chambers, people living in residential areas where they only communicate either with people who go to Cracker Barrel, people who go to Whole Foods. Um, and, and so people are sort of self-segregating. And I think that um, I still have some Republican friends, <laughs> one of them even evangelical. You mentioned Jillian about the evangelicals who vote for Trump and she was she will vote Republican whoever's on the ticket um, uh, because she wants conservative judges. And so one of the things that I've reminded her is that cancel culture, unlike the conservative narrative, is not just one sided. It's not, not just liberals saying we don't want to hear somebody who could be offensive um, or politically correct. So I just wonder what you both thought as experts in terms of how America moves forward in the age of social media to be more inclusive and going beyond any sort of sense of cancel culture. Um, There's some funny, funny noises off there. Can you can you hear me? We can hear you, Jillian. I think Laura has frozen. Take that into all the sort of. Oh, you're frozen. Okay. I just be really no, you okay? Fine. You you've gone mute. Mute. Um, I I think uh, many of these issues are being picked up. Um, there is obviously. Um, uh, I, th I think the whole debate about cancel culture is, is perhaps, um, I mean, as you say, it, it can affect left and right. Um, I think what, what I see rather as a rather frightening development is the kind of um, effort to exploit and develop um, arguments about critical race theory in the schools, even though it probably isn't taught in the schools, um, and to take out of schools certain kind of books, sort of, so these, these sort of, um, there's a sort of list of books that people want to see out of 
out of school libraries, which um, include sort of, you know, um, Mayor Angelou, and they include sort of um, Tony Morrison, and they they are about a whole range of things that haven't really got much to do with critical uh, race theory, or even about giving a more balanced view of history. So there's a kind of, I mean, it reinforces the idea both, I think, frighteningly, of there being two different kind of mindsets, two different kind of visions of America, but also that there are groups out there, as there have been for a long time, who are interested in textbook censorship, who are interested in uh, finding out what's um, in the in the school library, for finding out what children are being given to read. And um, I think that's incredibly dangerous. Now, um, there are some pretty odd and extreme um, things happening um, on campus around issues both in the United States and here about, for example, debating um, the rights of, uh, of transgender people. But that's, that's, I think, a slightly different kind of issue to a much more widespread movement that, that could really take off, particularly given, and I go back to the point about voting laws and the, the relationship between states, that if something seems to be working in one state or somebody gets a good idea for a campaign in one state, um, it gets picked up and funded perhaps by groups uh, who want to see it spread across other states. So in a sense, it's very rare that you get a local campaign remaining local for very long. Yeah, I, I think those are great observations. And the thing I'd pick up on is the rise of the issue of cancel culture and then the issue of critical race theory being taught in schools. These are not real crises in America. They're manufactured. And I think yeah. it goes back to something Jillian had mentioned earlier, how the think tanks on the conservative side in America have stopped functioning like they used to. If you go back to the 70s and 80s, these think tanks had positioned themselves as counterweights to liberal minded think tanks mm. that were saying, we have all this research saying government programs work, so we should do them. And conservatives formed their own think tanks to say they don't work. Well, in the 90s and early 2000s, those think tanks changed and said, forget about the research, let's <laughs> just figure out how to win. Yeah. And instead of trying to win on the issues, which in the United States, every time there's surveys put out asking people what you politically believe, the issues the Democratic Party supports are more popular than the issues the Republican Party supports. And I think the Republican Party learned you can't win on the issues. So what they decided to do instead is create non-issues to talk about and put the Democrats on defense. You don't want the Democratic Party talking about social welfare because people like that. You don't want the Democratic Party talking about health care because people like that. You want the Democratic Party to have to explain why critical race theory is being taught to 13 year olds in but America, it isn't. <laughs> but it isn't. But now every Democratic candidate on the campaign yep. trail is trying to explain to people this isn't happening. Oh, yep. but do you support it? I, I don't have an opinion on it because it's not happening. And suddenly they're playing defense. And we see yep. this every year in American politics that this issue emerges out of nowhere on Fox News oh. that galvanizes the right and puts the left on defense. Hmm. That's a really fascinating perspective from you both. Thank you so much for that. Um, I'd like to give the audience an opportunity to ask the last question. So if you have something niggling and, and, and a burning question, please do put it into the Q&A right now. Uh, in the meantime, I'll take the luxury of just asking one. Um, Jillian, you mentioned how you are anticipating, and perhaps as you've mentioned your pessimistic outlook, you are anticipating that the next Republican uh, is go even after Trump, uh, is going to embrace Trumpism, is going to be in his sort of mannerism and how it will last beyond him. And as we saw in 2016, when he faced a huge Republican field, we've seen some like Marco Rubio try and recreate him and it didn't go well. We saw continuing Ted Cruz trying to sort of recreate elements of Trump. And that doesn't seem to be appealing in the same way. And I just wondered if you could explain a bit more how you see Trumpism moving forward without Trump. 
Well, of course, the first, the, the, the big question is is really whether or not Trump is going to run. And I think if he does yes. run, then there's nobody's going to beat beat him. Assuming he doesn't run, on that assumption, then I think you're going to have somebody who can play, uh, who who can adopt a fairly populist style, um, someone who uh, will uh, be very good at getting the message across. Um, somebody who was certainly not going to play up, um, I, I think, any kind of detail on policy and, and will appeal to, I think, um, the instincts of what they see as the base. I mean, DeSantis seems to me to be the person who is likely to, um, uh, and preferably with, 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 I mean, this person will want Trump's blessing. Um, but I think he seems the person who will possibly, could possibly carry carry that legacy forward. But I can't see, I mean, given that all the things we've talked about um, uh, have put Republicans in a fairly uh, successful position, um, I, I can't see them changing their style and moving back towards a more moderate um, uh, style of Republicanism, which aims to overcome divisions. I think they're going to go on playing the same the same messages, at least while um, the numbers uh, look look right. I mean, obviously there will be an attempt to try and bring in more uh, Latino voters, um, mm -hmm. um, possibly an attempt to to broaden the appeal to to women and educated women. But that's not really gonna, that's not really what it's about. It's going to be about getting out your base, and mm -hmm. um, I, I think um, that's going to be done by hard hitting negative campaigns um, on cultural and social values as well as issues as well as of course on the economy it's going to keep us employed as academics for a long yeah. time that's a positive <laughs> note uh gary coy gets the luxury of the last final question um i don't know whether gary can uh vocalize it uh i'll give just a second here's gary hi gary can you unmute maybe microphone's working Mute. Okay, I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna go ahead, Gary, with your question. Uh, has the insurrection on the sixth of January been the nail in the coffin of American exceptionalism? <laughs> Final question. I guess that depends on what your definition of American exceptionalism is. Yes, because uh, Americans have very varied opinions on what it is that makes America exceptional. Some people point to the deep religious roots of the nation. Some people look at the innovation and the economic success of the nation. Uh, and a lot of people for a long time have really looked at the United States as the crown jewel of democracy in world history. Uh, and of course, there's a lot there to unpack. But I think for a lot of non-Republicans, January 6th was really damaging to this image of America as this exceptional democratic society. Mm. When you see people storm Congress like that, just full of anger and rage, and pushed on by a president who has clearly just lost an election and refuses to accept it, that was hurtful. Uh, a lot of people felt the strings of democracy being cut that day. Mm. But Republicans didn't see it that way. Republican voters largely today still believe mm -hmm. that it was a justified action. Uh, it was not done by Republicans. It was actually imposters from Antifa and they've excused it. Uh, and that's difficult to reconcile. It's mm -hmm. difficult to say what it means for the whole country when on yet another issue, there's no consensus even on what happened. Mm -hmm. um, I think for the world, January 6th, change the perception of America. For America, mm -hmm. I think they're turning a big blind eye to it right now. Yeah, I mean, I think I, I would certainly agree with that. I think the reputational damage to American democracy on January the 6th was huge. But I think the interesting question is, why is it that um, American political processes, including members of Congress, cannot agree on a process for working out exactly what did happen? And that that I think is is the the, the big the big question. Um, uh, it's not 
I mean, obviously, there, there is a lot of double think going on. Mm -hmm. And um, many Democrats uh, and many Republicans um, uh, obviously felt sympathy, if not more, for those people. These are our people. You know? This is our movement. And on that fascinating note, I'd like to thank uh, both of our expert panelists for a wonderful session. And I'm going to pass it back to Cora. Thank you so much, uh, Laura. Thank you very much to Gillian and David for, uh, for a wonderful session. Um, because uh, it's Friday afternoon, and I think we all know that the uh, Zoom fatigue is real, I'm going to encourage everyone to have a quick five minute break, stretch our legs, get a glass of water, whatever one everyone needs. So we will be back at 3.05. So uh, don't go too far away, uh, but we will see you soon. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> OK, I have to go, so thank you. Thank you, Gillian. Bye bye. Bye bye. See you in Oxford. As well. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Yeah. Pleasure to meet you. See you soon.
Hello, everybody, and welcome back. It is uh, five past three. Um, we are now into our second session. So I'm going to uh, hand over to Andrew Moran, who is going to, to chair this session, um, which I'm very much looking forward to, as I'm sure everyone is. So take it away, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you, Cara. Uh, good afternoon. My name's Andrew Moran. I'm the head of Criminology, Sociology, Politics and International Relations at London Metropolitan University. It's an absolute pleasure to be chairing this panel. We've got two expert panellists and they are Dr Ashley Godwin, who's a Senior Specialist in National Security and International Policy at the House of Commons and was recently seconded to work as a policy advisor to the Prime Minister. And then we have Dr Jonathan Montel, who is an Associate Professor in Political Science and the Director of the International Public Policy Programme at University College London. Welcome to you both. Uh, the format will be exactly as the format that we just had with the domestic policy session. So both Ashley and Jonathan are going to say a few things about foreign policy and then the floor is open for questions, either if you're able to get your microphone working or in the chat box on the side. So thank you very much. I don't know if you've decided who's going to go first. I'm happy to if that helps. That would be fabulous. Thank you. Right, no worries. The floor is yours. Um, thank you very much. And thank you very much to the ECHO Centre for inviting me to speak today. It's always a pleasure to be part of the APG conversation. And I, I really do hope that we'll be able to meet in person in the not too distant future. So I, um, I wanted to use my initial remarks to look at the bigger picture of foreign policy under Biden, and especially the strands of debate about the clarity of an emerging Biden doctrine and the drivers of the current administration's foreign policy, the potential continuity and changes from the Trump administration, and some of the more notable events of the past year. So I should say, to start with, that this isn't um, an area of detailed study of mine currently, but it is a subject I've engaged with fairly extensively throughout the past two years through both my work for select committees in Parliament, but also while working for Number 10 um, on the UK's Integrated Review of Security, Defence, Development and Foreign Policy, which was published earlier this year, as many of you know, um, just, just a couple of months after President Biden's inauguration. So um, to take us back to the start, I think it's fair to say that much of the Western world breathed a huge sigh of relief upon hearing the words, America is back, during Biden's first foreign policy speech just a few weeks into his administration. Um, I think this only served to reinforce all the positive signals of an administration that brought in an experienced group of mainstream figures, the staff a disciplined, predictable and sophisticated foreign policy. However, was America back in the way that the West expected? I would argue that this speech and that phrase in particular in the way it was quoted around the world set false expectations and that it did so for a couple of reasons. In part, this, this I think was the result of a misreading of Biden as an individual. Um, there was a really interesting article in Foreign Affairs in September that described Biden as a pragmatic realist who prioritizes the, the needs of US national security and its, national, its strategic interests over all foreign policy orthodoxy. And actually that he expects other countries to do the same in relation to their own interests as well. So the authors of this article track Biden's long history of engagement in US foreign policy from his vote against, against the first Gulf War by his support for intervention in the Balkans and for NATO enlargement in the 1990s, his support for intervention in Afghanistan and Iraq in the early 2000s, albeit with reservations on the latter, through to his scepticism about nation building that became ultimately downright opposition to the Iraq surge of 2009 to 11 as well as opposition to a Libya campaign that he described as being only in the US uh, peripheral strategic interests. So obviously this, this notion of realism is just one lens on events, but the article does paint a quite compelling picture of a man who long, uh, has long recognized the limits of what some have called muscular internationalism and, and certainly attempts to use American political and military power to shape the world in its own image. And the, the article also paints a picture of a man whose foreign policy views have consequently changed quite considerably depending on the prevailing circumstances. So for me, the emphasis on pragmatic realism does explain many of the administra uh, administration's actions, you know, whether taken by Biden personally or by his administration in general. 
and, and that would include actually his summits with Putin and Xi, even though obviously he's been criticized in some quarters for those. So perhaps the most telling quote of all in relation to Biden's approach came after the Putin summit, when he said that diplomacy is not, uh, is not about trust, it's straight up about doing business, identifying interests and where they align. So that's one thing, uh, a misunderstanding of Biden the man. But I would also suggest that that um, phrase, America is back, uh, spawned other false, other false expectations due to a wider misreading of trends in US foreign policy, especially in the past decade. I personally don't see Trump as the complete aberration from all that went before. And in some ways on the substance of his policy on issues such as US involvement in the Middle East and the need for European allies to step up, for example, I would suggest that Trump's extreme personality and style distracted from the realities of continuity in, in intent, if not in practice. So, so where does this leave us now? We've, we've set off with the world expecting something perhaps different from, uh, from what we've uh, ended up with. And um, Anne-Marie Slaughter wrote a very prescient article in October last year in the UK's Financial Times, in which she suggested that Biden's foreign policy would be about three Ds, domestic, deterrence, and democracy. Um, and having been closely involved in the creation of the UK's integrated review, I would say this is not probably not too dissimilar from the UK's approach. Um, certainly when we compared the draft integrated review with the Biden administration's interim national security strategy guidance in the week before the IELTS published, uh, we, we thought the number of similarities between the two was striking. And so, so given that defense, uh, sorry, deterrence and domestic um, deterrence and democracy are generally self-explanatory, albeit with a 21st century twist that speaks of uh, today's global and globalized landscape, I'd like to focus briefly on the domestic element that Anne-Marie Slaughter identified. So former Trump foreign policy advisor Carafino is not alone in criticizing Biden for seemingly putting major foreign policy issues on the back burner during the early months of, it, of his administration in favor of seizing a window of opportunity presented by the COVID-19 pandemic transform America. However, I do think that's at least a somewhat in, inaccurate interpretation of the Biden administration's intent. You need only read the September 2020 Carnegie Endowment paper by the now National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan, among others, to understand that this administration directly ties domestic strength, politically, economically, and socially, with the United States' ability to compete directly with authoritarian states such as China, as well as indirectly through shaping the international environment in its favor and in the favor of democracy in general. It really wouldn't surprise me if that paper, um, which was called US Foreign Policy for the Middle Classes, I'm sure many of you are familiar with it, became a seminal paper in understanding this administration's approach. In short, it makes clear that foreign policy shouldn't be allowed to become untethered from domestic needs in pursuit of unthinking internationalism, while also explaining clearly that democracies must deliver for their own citizens first in order to be both competitive in the international environment and attractive to others in the international environment. So for me, this closer linkage of domestic and international needs and outcomes may possibly explain some of the continuities of specific elements of Trump's policy, such as the trade war era tariffs. But it doesn't explain other elements of the Biden administration's handling of foreign policy issues, such as the withdrawal from Afghanistan and also the announcement of AUKUS, the, um, the, the security deal with the US, uh, between the US, UK and uh, Australia. It's probably not a surprise that the French foreign minister made a direct comparison between Biden and Trump in the wake of the AUKUS announcement, nor that some allies, NATO allies, um, complained that Biden either hadn't consulted them on his decision um, of, for the timeline of withdrawing from Afghanistan, or that their counsel had been ignored where he had consulted them. So if nothing else, I think um, these two events should really serve as a sharp reminder to the Biden team that they may want to put the Trump era to bed by announcing that America is back, but the world has moved on since 2016, but it can't simply erase the past four years. However, I am inclined on this one to agree with Stephen Walt, who saw these two incidents as 
really being extremely poor mishandling of the situations at hand, rather than as something out of the Trumpian American first playbook. Um, and to quote as Walt put it, it does seem that these were sensible policies being pursued carelessly by a team that was supposed to be a lot better at managing relations with friends and foes alike. So in Afghanistan in particular, there are questions to be answered about whether the intelligence just wasn't there or wasn't right, whether that information didn't make it to senior officials and principals, or whether those principals had the right information but made the wrong calls. Taking a step back, I think it's hard to avoid the conclusion that the failure to nominate and appoint key ambassadors and so many layers of political appointees within departments is having a really detrimental effect on the ability of the Biden administration to gather the information it needs to take the appropriate decisions and to engage with and represent its own interests uh, and positions with allies overseas. I think it, it is quite a shocking state of affairs that after nine months, only one ambassador had been appointed, the, the ambassador to Mexico. This leaves pretty much all other ambas uh, ambassadors to key allies and organizations unfilled. And this really matters the Biden agenda of shaping the world so that it continues to favor democracies. Um, just, just to take one example, we are now in a situation where Poland, Lithuania and Latvia are talking about convening NATO for Article 4 discussions, but there's no US ambassador to NATO in place with the full authority of the president. I think it's also worth pausing momentarily on the fact that one of the few areas of foreign policy success so far for Biden has been climate change, where uh, instead of sort of being done that's uh, something that's done through the system, you have instead a roving but respected and experienced envoy in the form of John Kerry, who's supported by the State Department, but not constrained by its encumbrances. So to, to bring my opening marks to a close, uh, all this has implications for what the Biden administration can achieve in what is a really complex world, it's multipolar, globalized, um, and, and in being globalized, um, there's a need to compete economically and in some ways ideologically, while also cooperating on major global issues such as climate change, global health, and obviously the recovery from COVID-19 in particular. But in this world, the helpful binaries of the Cold War just don't apply anymore. And in trying to navigate such complexity with a more um, realist, pragmatic approach, there is a real danger that the Biden administration's foreign policy will look undisciplined and incoherent, and indeed it will likely be really contradictory for much of the time as the goals themselves, the administration's goals, pull in different directions. So this may be one reason to limit the administration's ambitions to a set of issues that are that bit more manageable. It's certain Certainly true, while the government lacks the essential layers of political civil servant interface, without which the administration is liable, liable to score many more own goals of the type we've seen this summer. However, I would also argue that it's all the more essential to limit its um, ambitions if it wants to rebuild trust with allies and partners alike and to put down the roots of sustainable policy in key areas. And for me, this is really important because not only is the administration seeking to turn around the tanker in the wake of the last Trump administration, but um, it's also having to shake off the shadow of the president's future with a potential return of a Trump or a Trump-like successor in just three years' time. Thank you. Thank you very much for a very, very thought-provoking introduction. Um, Jonathan. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, and uh, yeah, I wanted to um, thank the organizers um, for um, inviting me um, to the workshop. Um, and uh, like um, Ashley, I study or think about foreign policy issues, although I guess with compared to Ashley with less real world consequence. Um, but I wanted to discuss um, a topic that I've looked at that I think might be um, of interest to an American politics research group, and that is the topic of US public opinion towards foreign policy issues. Uh, maybe this relates to the third um, D that Ashley mentioned of, on the domestic side. And I wanted to specifically discuss the narrative or idea or conventional wisdom over the last several years preceding Trump, but I think that sort of rose during Trump that there is a growing divide between the US public on the one hand and the US foreign policy um, elites or experts 
um, the foreign policy community, um, what has been derisively called um, the blob, the foreign policy blob uh, by a former Obama administration official um, on foreign affairs um, in which um, elites are, American elites are committed to continuing um, an expansive international role for the United States while the US public is increasingly turning inward. And I think a part of that narrative is also that that growing disconnect is generating a kind of populist backlash that Trump and others um, have exploited. And as an example of this view, I chose a quote uh, also like Ashley uh, from Stephen Walt, who is a prominent international relations scholar. And he's written that US foreign policy has been um, hijacked by quote, an out of touch community of foreign policy VIPs. So I just wanted to um, discuss some, some work, um, some survey work that I've done that tries to assess whether this claim um, is actually true, whether this is actually the case that there is a, a large and growing divide uh, between US, US foreign policy elites um, and the public on foreign policy issues, what that might mean for US foreign policy um, going forward. And this draws on survey work that I've done um, with some academic colleagues, as well as in partnership with the um, Chicago Council on Global Affairs. Um, over the past few years, um, we fielded uh, biannual surveys, both of the US public and also of US foreign policy elites. And these include individuals who are currently, who were serving in government, uh, foreign policy or national security positions in government at the time of the survey, as well as the wider community of academics, think tank, media, um, advocacy group, um, experts um, who are in the foreign policy business, essentially. And that uh, survey format allows us to compare both um, what experts think and what the public thinks on foreign policy issues, but also how experts perceive what the public thinks. And based on that work, I wanted to make um, two arguments um, to the group uh, to motivate some discussion on this, uh, on this question. Um, first argument is that um, we actually find little evidence for the claim that there is a large or growing gap in the views of US foreign policy elites and the public on foreign policy questions. In the most recent survey that we did in the summer of 2020, so, so preceding the election, um, we found that large majorities of both foreign policy elites and the public support pro-internationalist positions on a range of issues, including trade, immigration, the importance of maintaining global alliances, although elites tend to be, um, as you might expect, um, more supportive. So for example, on a kind of benchmark question that the Chicago Council has asked over about 40 years um, on the question of, quote, should the US play an active part in world affairs? 97% uh, of foreign policy experts agree, uh, unsurprisingly, um, compared to 68% of the public. On the question of whether um, international trade is good for the US economy, um, for example, 99% of our foreign policy elite sample agreed with that statement. Um, compared to 74% of the public. On the question of whether the US should reduce its commitment to NATO or withdraw from NATO, um, again, not surprisingly, only 3% of our elites, uh, elites in the sample agreed compared to 27% of the public. And another interesting finding from these surveys is that during the Trump administration, um, comparing surveys from 2016 um, prior to the election to 2020, the public actually moved closer to the elite view on trade, immigration, and alliance issues. That is, Trump failed to carry the public debate um, towards his view on those questions. And in fact, um, a, a small but sizable uh, percentage of the public moved away from Trump um, on those questions. Second argument that I wanted to make was that US foreign policy elites consistently underestimate public support for pro-international positions. So in our survey, we added a little bit of a twist where we ask experts to estimate what they think the average public response will be on various questions related to um, yeah, various foreign policy issues. Um, and in the 2020 survey, for example, we found that elites underestimated public support for decreasing legal immigration, for example, by about 20 percentage points. Um, similarly, elites underestimated the public support for continuing an active role in NATO by about 22 um, percentage points. Um, and that pattern continues across a range of topics that um, elites typically predict that um, a minority um, or at least a sort of plurality of the public um, supports these pro-internationalist positions when in fact there are uh, large majorities of public support um, for them. Um, interestingly, we also found that the elites, elites degree of inaccuracy um, how inaccurate they were in estimating what the public would think 
didn't really vary by dimensions you might think, such as partisanship, both Democratic leaders and Republican leaders consistently underestimated or mis mis misunderestimated, if I may say, uh, public support for international positions. Um, it didn't really vary by professional group, whether you had served in government or not, whether you were um, in a think tank role or media role or interest group role, very, fairly consistently across these professional categories, um, foreign policy experts underestimated how much public support there was for pro-internationalist positions. Um, probably the group that was the least uh, accurate was academics. Um, so make of that what you will, although not always to a statistically significant degree. So uh, make of that uh, uh, what you will. Um, in short, I think the sort of bottom line that we have found from running these surveys over a number of years is that elites are out of touch with what the public thinks but their views are not actually out of step. There is more consensus between what the blob, what US, the US foreign policy establishment and community thinks the US should do on foreign affairs um, compared, to the, compared to the public. Um, and so that's sort of our major um, conclusion. That's sort of the major conclusion that I wanted to put to the group for discussion, but I think it also raises a couple of um, interesting questions. Um, one is I think it raises the question of what is driving this elite misperception of the public? Um, these survey results that I've discussed um, are from the last few years, um, from the Trump and Biden administration, from the Trump administration and, and prior. Um, but looking at these surveys over a number of years, the past 10 years or 20 years, um, you see a consistent and durable pattern of elites misperceiving um, the degree, overestimating the degree to which the public takes isolationist positions on issues like trade, immigration, alliances, um, use of force questions, as well as general questions of whether the US should play an active global role um, or not. So one question is, what, what is driving this durable misperception? It's not a, it may have accelerated during the Trump um, era, um, hopefully the first Trump era, I don't think Trump era, but um, it preceded Trump. That, that, that misperception, um, we, find, we find evidence that that misperception pre preceded Trump. I think it also raises the question of whether correcting this misperception um, in the minds of um, foreign policy experts would have any tangible benefits. Um, it may be the case that uh, political leaders, party leaders, uh, might be more willing to embrace costly or difficult policy decisions on issues like climate change, um, for example, if they were made aware um, of the depths of public support. But yeah, I think that's a, 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 as well as whether it would just in general um, improve democratic accountability um, for uh, political leaders to be more, to be able to more accurately assess or be more accurately aware of what the public thinks on on key foreign policy questions. So I will uh, leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jonathan. So the so two two excellent papers, and I, I, I'm hoping that we will get some excellent questions as a result. So the floor the floor is now open. I can see one straight away from a long term supporter of the APG, Elizabeth Grant, which says, "Absolutely fascinating, excellent introduction. Just a thought." Could President Biden task VP Kamala Harris with getting ambassadors and senior representatives to organizations in play? She seems to have been kept quite really quiet. This needs to change, surely. I think that's probably directed at you, Ashley. <laughs> Yeah, no, that, I was I was just thinking that. Um, thank you so much for the question. Um, I have to say my knowledge of uh, the sort of internal workings of uh, US, the sort of the intricacies of the US government system is, is fairly basic. So I won't pretend to answer that question in full. What I will say sort of what I observe is that actually what the, the government does seem to, the Biden administration does seem to have made a choice to prioritise the, the big bills you've just seen in the past in the last couple of months. Um, but now is, you know, in favour of sort of waiting and holding off for getting its Senate votes through. But um, is probably now in danger of running into the next slew of big legislation, such as the um, Defence Authorisation Act. And in some respects, it feels as though it's, it's allowed itself to become hostage to, to the drumbeat of um, legislation going through Congress. I, I won't answer the rest. I'm sure there'll be many more people uh, on this call who, who are in a better position to answer that question than me. So I, I won't pretend to, to get towards the detail of that one. Okay. Um, shall I ask, so Peter, Peter Gordon, you've asked a question here. I wondered if your microphone works or you'd like me to read the question out. Oh, I can I'll see I'll you. I'll try. Can, can you hear me? I can, we can hear you, yes, that's great. Hey, 
Yeah, so Christian's basically about US isolationism. Much of its history, of course, the US has been very isolationist, but we've seen times um, when that's changed, really, because it perceives a threat from abroad. The obvious example there was the uh, was the uh, USSR. How do you, how, how isolationist do you see the US at the moment? And it's slightly changed. I mean, the obvious example is uh, China. And if China adopts a more expansionary um, economic uh, uh, foreign policy, uh, which it may do under Xi, uh, what effect will that have? For instance, the USA might need to, uh, might wish to adopt a, um, a, a, a wider alliance against China. I don't know. What, what's your thoughts on that? Shall I, uh, shall I take the first uh, shot at that? Yeah, excellent question. Thank you. Um, um, yeah, my, my sense is that over the past, um, at least for the survey data um, that we have over the past few decades, that yeah, there there is a a fairly durable but small minority of the public that at least in on these surveys takes the position a, a sort of true isolationist position. You know that that the U.S. should um, withdraw from global affairs, um, should withdraw from military alliances around the world, um, should not intervene in various scenarios. Um, and it tends to be, I think, uh, um, surprising. I think that runs against the conventional um, uh, a wisdom a bit. Um, you know, on the question, should the US play an active role in world affairs, um, which is a question that, as I mentioned, the Chicago Council has been asking since I think 1974, and in some form even, even before that. Um, the percentage of the public that basically agrees with that sort of basic question of international orientation has been pretty steadily between 60 to 70% over four or five decades, you know, and, and how much weight you want to put on that data, that that kind of evidence, I, I think that could be it could be up for debate. How much importance or salience the public attaches to those kinds of pro-international positions, maybe that varies as well. But I think the the fundamental orientation of the U.S. public in the post-war era, from what this these a wide range of sort of survey type projects have indicated, is that there is a, that, that isolationist view has never really broken through um, beyond a small but, but dedicated minority. Thank you, Ashley, I wondered if you wanted to comment. Yeah, I, can I just say, I thought um, the survey um, data that Jonathan was talking about in, the, in his presentation was absolutely fascinating. And I would only wish that we in the UK had a sort of back catalogue of these surveys um, tracking these sorts of issues. I think, um, there's one group now, the British Foreign Policy Group, that's just started to undertake these types of surveys, and and we we did um, we definitely took a lot of uh, put a lot of store in that during the integrated view and trying to understand public opinion. But to have that history is is fascinating. Um, I think for me, I quite like Walter Russell Mead's work on this sort of issue about sort of the Jacksonian, the Wilsonian, the Hamiltonian, and the one that I always forget and now can't remember. But he. Um, he basically takes sort of different elements of American history and, and, and tracks those trends, that the, those approaches towards foreign policy through right through to the modern day. So that, if you're interested in that sort of thing, I think it's worth reading. But what I would say, uh, Jeffersonian is the last one. What I would say is that um, I'm not sure being isolationist anymore is, is, some, is, is a label that can realistically and accurately be applied because in a globalized world, um, where your your trade is so very interlinked, as uh, unlike the um, Cold War, with some uh, a power that is becoming ever more sort of certainly a rival, certainly more competitive, probably an adversary as well, potentially a threat in the long term. Um, I don't think it, the terms and labels such as isolationism really apply anymore. It's probably not possible when those sort of threats and uh, vulnerabilities cross your borders so easily. Thank you. I've got I've got two questions now. Um, I'll go quickly to Richard Johnson, who has uh, typed a question in because his, his mic's not working, unfortunately. He says, how much blame should the Biden, and this is directed at, at Ashley, um, but Jonathan, feel free to comment as well. Um, how much blame should the Biden administration receive for the lack of US ambassadors? My understanding is the main blockage has been the blanket hold placed by the Republicans on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, with Ted Cruz as main ringleader. And given Democrats did something similar to Trump nominees four years ago, do uh, does the new reality? Oh, sorry, do you the new reality is is the new reality that every president, sorry, will now struggle to fill ambassadorial nominations in the first year? 
I sincerely hope not, um, but I suspect that may be the way it's going. Um, it does mean that you can't really get your foreign policy going and active for, for your first year, and then obviously you're in, in the year towards your midterms. Um, I think, to be honest, it, it's a mixture of both. As, as I understand it, is uh, the Biden administration was actually particularly slow in nominating um, individuals in the first place. Um, I've certainly I've read a few different things that blame the uh, focus on sort of diversity and inclusion. I don't know how true that is. Um, but my understanding is it's basically it's both. It's slow nomination in the first place and then um, real reluctance slash political grandstanding in, in the Senate in terms of uh, refusing to um, approve or at least to hear those approvals uh, in the Senate as well. Um, as I understand, it's, it was Ted Cruz alone for a while, primarily, but also now uh, Josh Hawley also um, holding up the process in response to Afghanistan and certainly demanding uh, that I think it's the he wants the um, National Security Advisor, the Secretary of State to step down uh, in the wake of the Afghanistan uh, crisis in the summer uh, in return for approving nominations. So I, I think it's a bit of both in this instance. Thank you. Jonathan, did you, would you like to add or? Should we move on to the next one? Uh, let's move on. Yeah, I'm happy move on. on. Okay, so the next one is thank you, uh, Ashley. The next one is for, from Andy Andy Rowe. Uh, Andy, I'm hoping your mic will work so you can ask. And it's about public opinion. Yeah. Um, thanks, Andrew. Uh, so yes, specifically to Jonathan. Um, yeah, I think it's really fascinating data there, Jonathan. Um, but of course, public opinion is not just about distribution; it's also about intensity, and you know, the data that you um, described suggested there's not much of a constituency for, for Trump's sort of uh, public opinion positions. But, you know, maybe he's got intensity on his side. You know, so I think on immigration, it's the anti-immigrationists who are more intense. On, on globalisation, it's the anti-globalisationists. It's the anti-free traders. So Trump, yeah, he might not have, he might not stand where the majority of the American people stand, or he might not stand near the median voter, but he's on the side of those people who feel really, really strongly about these issues. So on the one hand, your opinion, your, your data sort of doesn't match with, you know, Trump, the success of the Trump presidency or the success of electoral success of the Trump presidency. But on the other hand, there's a bit missing. And that, that bit that's missing is about the, where the intensity of opinion lies. I agree. It, it, it's an excellent point. Um, we've, we've thought a lot about that question of how to capture the intensity of um, or, or weight that the public places, voters place on foreign policy issues re, re, you know, relative to other kinds of issues, domestic issues. And what, to what extent do those preferences actually translate into you know, voting or, or real political action? And it is very difficult uh, to get at. And I look forward to hearing comments from American you, you all are the experts. <laughs> so maybe you have some suggestions about how to actually get at that question. I think the question of whether or not there is this sort of vocal minority of, of Trump supporters where, yes, they, they may not have the median voter on their side, but they have intensity on their side. I think there are two versions of that argument. One version is that, you know, that just might explain this degree of misperception that this sort of media narrative or general narrative that there is this growing constituency for those um, anti-trade or anti-immigration views is being distorted by the fact that that minority is becoming more vocal, but they don't actually represent where the true center of gravity of public opinion is. So, so it could be that it's that's what's driving this misperception, but not actually changing anything. I think the other version of that argument is, yeah, th those are more they care more, uh, there's more intensity around those issues. So they are, they are voting and organizing and acting on those issues in a way that say a, a pro-trade voter may, may not be. So which of those two is actually the case? I, uh, I don't know. Okay. Um, whilst we're waiting for another question, can I, uh, and I'm hoping that, that you, you still have 15 minutes to ask questions, so please do, if I can, have the chair's privilege and ask a quick question as well, but based on anecdotal evidence from students, I just wonder whether you feel that it's too late for Biden in terms of America being back. The, listening to students I have from Africa, from Latin America, from the Asian subcontinent, the point they often make is that China, Russia, India, 
have filled the vacuum that the the, the end of the Obama years, if you think about the lack of action in Syria, and then the actions of the Trump administration withdrawing from globalization, withdrawing from climate change uh, regulations and so on, that this provided an opportunity for other countries to take advantage of that. And Biden's going to find it very hard to recover that. And, and touching on what, I'm being an academic asking the wrong question, I'm sorry. Touching on that with a point that you were making, Ashley, which is about whether the public or states trust America in the future, because will we see Trump again? Um, I mean, if we think of Macron and Merkel talking about Europe creating its own army, you know, has America's moment gone? Is it too late for Biden? That's a very big question, a long answer. I'm so question. I'm sorry about that. I'm assuming that's meant for me, uh, or at least in the it's meant for both of you. Meant for both of you. It's a really, it's a big question as well as a long question, so that's really good. Um, I, I, to be honest, I it is going to be really difficult for all of the reasons you've said. Um, I mean, I think some things may or may not come to pass. I, I'm still skeptical of a European army in in the form that is politically decisive. Uh, if not mil militarily. Um, but yeah, I, th I think our anecdotal evidence is really important. Um, and there, ha there has been a vacuum. It has been, um, it has been filled in some respects. And actually, um, it, it requires the Biden administration to be even more focused on the things where it can actually make an immediate difference and a substantive difference. Uh, and also to, to avoid the sorts of own goals we've seen this summer where you can just annoying allies for no reason, um, really completely unnecessarily. For me, it's sort of, it may well be too late, but I think it's by degree, not by sort of totality. I'll just add, I, again, that's also a, a it's a big and, and challenging question. And I, I think, yeah, to me, the answer is I, I hope not. <laughs> I hope that's not the case. <laughs> uh, time will, Time will tell. Um, I guess from my point of view, a lot of the benefits that a Biden administration um, can deliver are there just, just by virtue of, of winning the election and being in power. Um, and maybe they are just purely defensive, um, but to just minimize um, the change and the changes that Trump could have wrought, the damage that he could have wrought had he come back for a second term. Um, we can all speculate about what those might be or would have been or what they might be um, two years, three years from now. Um, but I just think the, the very fact of being elected, the very fact of blocking um, further damage on a host of foreign policy interests, to me, is a, a victory in itself. Um, so, so whether or not they can get a lot of their agenda through or across, um, you know, yeah, we'll, uh, we'll see. Um, and to the extent they're getting in their own way about that, um, as Ashley's arguing, I, I guess we'll see too. But to me, that's, that's benefit enough. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I wonder if there are any more questions from the audience. We, we've got a few minutes left. Um, I think it's a Friday afternoon. Jonathan. I have, I have a question for Ashley, if I might. Um, <laughs> I, I'm kind of curious. I mean, from your, your vantage point um, within government, um, you know, you, you see issues like ambassadorial appointments um, or these very kind of um, sort of um, civil service issues, um, very sort of um, detailed operational governmental things. Um, how much of an impact do you think that those ultimately have on, on policy decisions and, and policy outcomes? Because the, you know, the basic conflicts of interest, the basic you know, calculus that sort of high level government leaders are making around issues like climate change or um, the Australia Treaty or Taiwan or whatever the issue on the front burner is, um, those those that, that sort of basic interests exist, you know, whether or not there's an ambassador in place or an acting ambassador or whoever it may be. So I see why from your vantage point, th those things are, th those are in your vision, uh, your field of vision, but how much do you think they actually make a difference in terms of real tangible policy outcomes? Uh, that's a really fair question. Um... It's something I've thought a lot about actually since leaving government. There, were, there wasn't much time to think about it while I was in government, but it's something I've, I've really sort of started to think about a lot more in the last few months. Um, I think you're totally right. There are obviously some, some structural um, premises, if you like, of all foreign policy for countries. You know, most national interests are enduring. 
um, you know, things don't change that quickly. It's unlikely that um, a piece of information from an Afghan, an ambassador in Afghanistan, for example, would have changed a lot of what happened. Certainly that wasn't the case in the UK. That, that is how it appears from the media reporting, at least. Uh, and I think also it depends a bit where you sit within that government system as well. If you sit at the center, um, I think the forces that come into play in, in terms of decision making are very different to if you're sitting at a post somewhere around the other side of the world. But one thing I would say I, I did observe in my time, and something again I'm still thinking through, is just how much sort of if you're trying in a strategy making process, which was the process we just went through in the UK government, um, really, yes, you have that sort of structured ends, ways, means way of thinking about things. But there's a reality to strategy making and all decision making, at least at the centre of government, where you get what I would call the four P's coming into play. So that is um, politics, personality, uh, politics, small p, big p, uh, power, the, the realities of power and how it flows across government. And then finally, the processes you put in place to manage those things towards your end goal. Um, so I, to, to bring it back to your question, I think, I think it's both, and I think it depends where you sit in government, and, and understanding the complexity of the government machine is, is just, I mean, it's mind-boggling. And um, I think for me, you know, we talk quite a lot about, you know, the fog of war, uh, you know, it's very ingrained in our sort of our communities' conversations and understanding that there's external uncertainty that affects our decision making. I'd quite like to start talking about the fog of governance, <laughs> where we talk about the internal uncertainty of the inner workings of government uh, and governance as well in the way that that shapes decision making too. I think, I think the, the, there's a question come uh, into the chat based on that from Elizabeth, I think, which coming out of it, which is, do you think there's a tendency for elites to stay in their own circles rather than risk face-to-face -face opportunities with people who might disagree with them? That's an, uh, that, yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, and I think, um, uh, yeah, from my perspective, um, the, the question of whether or not there is this um, gap in foreign policy, this elite public gap in foreign policy, their foreign policy views, I think is tied to a, a larger narrative of there being a kind of um, polarization, a vertical polarization, whatever you might call it, between elites and increasingly disconnected and globalized and um, urban elite, um, professional elite in the United States and the, the rest of the country. Um, and, to, and to what extent that, that social and economic um, and educational um, party-based polarization um, translates into these kinds of views. And if you are, yeah, if you are an academic, um, I'll use myself as an example. <laughs> uh, I live in London. I go back to visit my parents in New York City. I travel back and forth. It's very rare, you know, that I have, you know, that, that's a very unique experience, you know, that, that there, is a, there is a kind of bubble um, around that kind of experience. Although I did teach for a few years at the University of Oklahoma, so I'll take that as, as credit <laughs> on my side. Uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, to what extent that actually explains this gap, um, the, the inability of um, um, elites and experts to accurately or within some degree of some boundary, bounds of accuracy understand what the public thinks. Yeah, I, I don't know um, how much of it is actually explained by that. I mean, one curious, finding um, that, that we've been thinking a lot about is the fact that those, those groups of elites who, you, who might have an incentive to really understand what the public thinks, that is foreign policy specialists working in Congress, you know, members of Congress, um, people who are tied to elections are no better at guessing what the public thinks than think tank experts um, or uh, media experts um, or people in interest groups or advocacy groups that deal with foreign affairs. Um, so it, it seems to be the case that even when you have an incentive to really understand what your own district thinks on this issue, people often underestimate it. And we're all, other, other groups of academics are finding that that's similarly true on domestic policy issues, um, that congressional people tied to elections and parties um, tend to think the public is more conservative um, than it is. And now there's a little bit of a literature around that question um, as in terms of what's driving that. Um, so I think that that point is, is yeah, that to me that is definitely on the table as a possible explanation for what's what's fueling this misperception, not the divide itself, but the misperception of it. 
I think um, that's the point where we can uh, take a break for a few minutes. They were great. As, as uh, Thank you very much for your answers. I think Cara is hoping to get the congressman online in about 10 minutes. So it's, good to, it's a good time for us to, to have a break. Can I thank you both uh, for some excellent uh, presentations? I'm, I'm, I'm lucky enough that I think I'll, I'll meet both of you this evening and get the chance to, dr to drill you with some questions a little bit more. I'll grill you with questions a bit more. So thank you ever so much. That was fabulous. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thanks a lot to, uh, to Jonathan and Ashley um, and to Andrew for chairing. So um, as Andrew mentioned, our, our third and final session coming up after the break is our uh, Congress session where we have our two former members of Congress uh, who will be sharing their insights with us. And having been lucky enough to be with um, Senator Tim Hutchinson and Congressman Larry LaRocco uh, for most of this week, um, I have uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed um, hearing their insights and I'm eager to do so again. So the fact that after five days, I still want to hear them talk, I hope uh, gives you all a sense of how, of how good they've been. So um, I'm gonna encourage everyone to, to, uh, to take a break, step away from their computer uh, and come back at four o'clock. So thank you so much, everyone. See you shortly.
Are you attending an event and is it the break time? <laughs> Your powers of deduction are, are improving. Yes, they are. <laughs> what event? The Eccles Center, in cooperation with the American Politics Group of the British Association of, I don't know, wow. American Politics, are you whatever. I just did. So no, what, how was that? That's over now. Um, not terrible. Think of terribly. Great. Uh, you know, hey, I have a low bar these days. <laughs> yeah. We go terribly, so. I have a very low bar. Excellent. Excellent. They were enthusiastic. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. They've got some uh, senator who's about to come on. Oh, right. And then we're going to have dinner. I'm going to have dinner. Not on Zoom, I hope. Not on Zoom. You're going to meet in person. Which senator is it? The conference is on Zoom, but the dinner is in person. Yeah. Is, that a weird, is that a weird hybrid? You're not on Zoom, actually. <laughs> what are these jokers thinking? Hey, you are on Zoom. I'm you. I think you are. I'm trying to be on Zoom. Tim Hutchinson? Oh, I'm not on mute. <laughs> Welcome back everybody. It's now uh, four o'clock and so we're going to get started with our final session. I'm going to invite um, Larry and Tim uh, and potentially my colleague Philip who is with them to, oh. um, to turn on uh, their camera. Uh, there we go and also oh. we should have I hope Professor Philip Davis who's going to, uh, to chair the session. Um, so take it away Phil, thank you very much. 
thanks thanks very much uh cara and uh thanks uh, for everything you've done today uh, uh including uh sorting out these technical issues so we can have our congressional team with us uh larry and tim good to see you again um ladies and gentlemen larry and tim have been here in the uk all week and have done a series of events uh for which we're very grateful um to university students and school students and uh and uh, public events uh as well um uh, uh this is great generosity on their part we <laughs> uh, sadly for them we don't pay any fees uh we 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 just ask ask people nicely to volunteer um, and volunteering a week of your life uh, to do a program that starts uh, early in the morning and goes to late at night uh, is, um, it, it, is, is quite a lot to ask. So we're very, very grateful uh, for their involvement. Um, uh, I'm going to ask them uh, briefly to introduce themselves. Um, uh, Larry, uh, um, just to set it off, Larry uh, is uh, uh, from Idaho um, and uh, was uh, a member of the House of Representatives. Tim from Arkansas uh, was a member of US Senate. Uh, gentlemen, if you could take just a couple of minutes to uh, introduce yourselves, say how you got, how and why you got into politics. Larry, you want to begin? Sure. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, Phil, it's been such a great week and I want to thank uh, all the sponsors of this trip uh, in coordination with the U.S. Association of Former Members of Congress. This is sort of our uh, last official gig here uh, before we all meet uh, casually for dinner. But it's been a great week. We've reached many students and uh, um, your hospitality has been superb. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm Larry LaRocco. Um, I served in the first district of Idaho from 1991 to 1995. Um, I started in politics um, as a staffer for S former Senator Frank Church. Uh, I was his field representative in an area that was half a congressional district. And after Church lost in 1980, I don't know if it was out of anger or, uh, you know, or re realization that I represented him in half a congressional district, I, I ran for Congress in 1982. Um, I had a very innovative campaign. I took jobs in every one of the counties for a week at a time and called it my working for Congress campaign. And uh, I ran against an incumbent. Unfortunately, uh, I only got 46 and a half percent of the vote. Not bad for a first time out uh, candidate against an incumbent, uh, but no cigar. And so uh, I ran uh, for the state Senate unsuccessfully. Uh, uh, in 86, got 47% of the vote, swore off incumbents. But uh, uh, in 1990, the seat opened up. I ran again. And, and uh, uh, like many members of the House uh, uh, who uh, were successful, they were unsuccessful maybe in a try or two before. I, I prevailed against an uh, entrenched Republican and uh, became the first Democrat in a quarter of a century to win the seat in the first district of Idaho. I served on the banking and interior committees. Uh, Idaho is a public land state. 62% of the state is owned by the federal government. So that was pretty important for my constituents. And uh, I lost in the big sweep of 94 and uh, uh, became one of, of 11,000 Americans to serve in the Congress. I ran for Lieutenant Governor uh, and the US Senate uh, in 2006 and 2008 unsuccessfully. And uh, now I just try and mentor uh, young people. And uh, if I ran again for office, I'd be divorced. I've been married 54 years, and I think I'll just stay on the sidelines. But I do programs like this, and uh, I'm grateful to be here. Larry, uh, let me just say how much I have enjoyed working with you this week. It's been a real, a real pleasure getting to know you. Uh, Phil, thank you for the hospitality and, and the whole team. Uh, we have been made to feel so welcome, and it's been a, 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 a just a glorious week and a great time. So uh, I'll give a, a thumbnail of my history. I'm from the state of Arkansas. For those of you who have not traveled through the middle part of the United States, we're in the middle of the country near the Mississippi River, border in the Mississippi River, and in the southern part of the country. So um, uh, I'm from the northwest part of that state, which is the hill country. Uh, which at one time was the only Republican part of Arkansas was up in the hills. We were 
we were pro-North. And so we were very much in the minority. I grew up on a farm there. Always had an interest in politics, though I never thought I'd run for office. Uh, I, I uh, After graduating from college, try to abbreviate this. After graduating from college, I got my master's degree in political science, eventually running for the Arkansas State Legislature uh, in a overwhelmingly democratic state at the time. Uh, we had out of 100 members of the Arkansas House, there were nine Republicans. That's how democratic it was then. It's just absolutely the opposite now. After serving eight years in the Arkansas legislature, we had an open seat uh, that was created uh, in the in my congressional district. And there was a fierce battle because it had first time it had opened up in 26 years. Uh, I won a three man Republican primary, then defeated the Democrat in a difficult Republican year. Bill Clinton was at the head of the ticket that year from Arkansas. Uh, after serving two terms in the U.S. House, I was persuaded to run for the United States Senate in 1996, and I was the notable uh, distinction of being the first Republican elected to the United States Senate from Arkansas since its inception in 1836. So it had been 160 years without a Republican. Since that time, I served one term in the Senate. Uh, the state of Arkansas politically has turned a very dark red and they have elected uh, the whole congressional delegation and both senators are all now Republican. So dramatic change, I like to say, well, I created all of that, but I didn't. But it was a lot of factors. Uh, since uh, leaving the U.S. Senate, I've my wife and I stayed in the D.C. area uh, in Alexandria, Virginia, and I stay on the Hill quite regularly and stay in touch with a lot of my colleagues and new senators who have been elected since I left. Um, and so that's uh, that's kind of my political background. We can't hear you, Phil. <laughs> yes. Oh, dear. Oh, I was trying to stay out of your way. Uh, uh, thanks very much, both. Uh, now, ladies and gentlemen out there who, who are watching, uh, of course, we We'd like to be driven by your questions. Uh, uh, none have arrived at the moment, but please uh, feel free to uh, throw questions into Q and A or chat. I'll look them up. Um, uh, uh, if if you don't, I'm perfectly capable of keeping this going for an hour. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, uh, but we'd much prefer to hear from you, uh, um, Tim and and Larry. In the absence of immediate thoughts from our colleagues out there, during this week. Um, what questions have come up? Now you've met hundred, hundreds of uh, uh, members of audiences. What questions have come up that you have been surprised by or, or felt you know, particularly notable among the things that have uh, been, been thrown at you in this week? We had a lot of curveballs. Uh, they're very bright, very bright students who had done their homework. They had done a lot of research on our past, our voting records. So a lot of questions, I think, comparative, comparing the uh, parliamentary system in, in the UK to the presidential system in the United States. There were a lot of questions that we expected, but right off the bat, we got, uh, we got hit with a question from a Afghan refugee student, a very moving moment when he put us on the spot about the messy withdrawal from Afghanistan. I thought that was a surprise. I was taken aback by um, a question about votes that I cast 20 years ago, wanting me to justify that vote. So I had to do a little backtracking and apologizing for some of my votes. So they were very, very sharp students. Larry? Yeah. Um, when I've been abroad, um, uh, I generally get questions on uh, the Electoral College, guns, and health care, uh, because that's what people don't understand uh, about our culture and so forth. So we got a few of those, but um, I was sort of amazed, Phil, at the questions that we got on the Supreme Court. 
and uh, and and, and uh, the question of abortion and the detailed knowledge of what's going on in Texas, for example, and and uh, so that led to a, a pretty good discussion on uh, judges and and Trump's success and uh, uh, nominating and confirming uh, you know the court and and the role of the court. Um, that that surprised me that the granular knowledge about the Texas case uh, came up during our discussions. Um, of course, it, on, on any kind of um, uh, visit of this kind, uh, questions are going to look uh, backwards as well as forwards. Um, uh, uh, so it, it seemed to me, not that I was at every event, but quite a few. Uh, <laughs> in looking backwards, people were very interested in uh, what your response was to uh, the Trump presidency uh, uh, and looking forwards, uh, uh, what your uh, feeling was uh, about the midterms. Uh, another thing that came up kind of, if you like, more granular was the effect of social media. Um, and uh, I, I've just literally in the in the break that we had, I've just uh, received an email pointing out that in the last month, uh, advertising on social media in the uh, uh, in the states, um, amongst the top ten advertisers, most of them are Republican advertisers. They have spent about one and a half million dollars in the last month, whereas the couple of Democratic participants have spent only about $300,000. Is this an area where uh, the, you know, the Republicans appear to have established uh, a, an, uh, an advantage and where the Democrats are just failing to catch up? Um, I'll go ahead. Yeah. Um, first of all, we did get that question and, and it came in the form of, uh, so what's the difference between when you were in office and now? And, and the answer uh, immediately is social media and the communications and the flow of misinformation, disinformation, and so forth. So, so uh, we had a, a you know a robust discussion about that. Um, um, I think that the Democrats, or, I mean, the Republicans, as, as I view things, and based on the statistics that you just gave, Phil, on the, uh, the expenditure, are into branding mode. And I think they're, they're being very aggressive about uh, branding Democrats uh, before the midterm elections, not waiting for the primaries to sort things out. I think uh, they're, they're going to start now, and it's, it's uh, going to be relentless uh, in terms of branding the Democrats as being... Uh, uh, away left uh, socialists. I mean, there'll be lots of uh, trigger words that will be used, um, and they'll try and uh, take uh, the steam out of uh, the passage of the infrastructure bill and uh, build back better uh, by uh, uh, defining it before the Democrats have a chance to define it. And I, I think that's a very concerted um, effort on the Republicans. Not a bad strategy, by the way. And I think uh, the Democrats have to. Uh, uh, get going. And, and uh, you know, you have to brand your opponent, you have to brand yourself. Um, and uh, and uh, there's a saying, of course, that I'm sure all the political scientists are aware of, and that is, if you're explaining, you're losing. So you've got to be out there and be aggressive. And uh, um, I'll, I'll just conclude this answer by saying, uh, the one question we got during the week was, what would you do if you were to whisper in Joe Biden's ear? And my, my answer was, uh, get out of D.C. and go sell uh, your accomplishments, because uh, this infrastructure bill has got something for everybody. So specifically on the on the issue of social media, I think Donald Trump proved the power of social media. He he uh, especially well throughout his campaign and throughout his presidency, used social media to can to go over the heads of. Uh, both the media and uh, politicians to get his message out. And it was incredibly effective. Uh, as far as advertising, you know, I think Republicans may be ahead uh, on uh, the value of and the use of uh, social media advertising. Uh, we just came through in the state of Virginia, the gubernatorial election. And I, I stay on Facebook more than I'm an older generation. So I'm looking at Facebook more than I am. Um, some on Twitter, but not so much Instagram and some of the others. But on Facebook in particular, 
I never saw uh, Terry McAuliffe, the Democratic candidate for governor, never saw one of his uh, ads on Facebook. It was a nonstop barrage of ads on the on the part of uh, the Republican Yonkin who ended up winning. Uh, so I take from that, well, maybe Republicans are ahead on that. Uh, I'm told that it's more, it's pretty cost efficient compared to television advertising. There was a barrage of advertising on both sides on, on, the, on the network, on cable news. But on the use of uh, Facebook, I saw a real advantage for the Republicans. If I may, I, I have a quick comment on that, uh, uh, not on that specifically, but uh, everything Tim said brought back that Democrats are spending a lot of money on field organizations right now, and they believe in, quote, field. And um, um, I know they tried it in, in uh, uh, Virginia, but uh, obviously it didn't work. But that's where there's a lot of emphasis right now rather than on other uh, forms of voter contact. Um, we've got a question from uh, Julie Kolokotza. Um, can I bring her up? Um, oops. Well, I certainly can't if I press that button. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Julie Kolokotza, um, uh, if, you, if you'd like to um, uh, unmute and ask your question, um, Julie is a former staffer for Barbara Canelli, who has done Congress Campus UK previously. Um, uh, but does not seem to be responding to uh, that request. Um, anyway, if I can get Julie's question up. How do you feel about the state of bipartisanship in Washington these days? Are folks speaking with colleagues on the other side of the aisle anymore? Um, and I guess she's uh, bringing to his her experience on uh, on Barbara Canelli's staff. Well, uh, I'll start on this one. <laughs> uh, bipartisanship is almost non-existent, and the level of vituperation and uh, 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 extreme partisan hyper partisanship is at a new level. I, I think we saw that. Uh, in the last 24 hours when Kevin McCarthy stood on the floor of the House of Representatives as the Republican majority leader or minority leader and railed against the Build Back Better legislation for seven to eight hours, uh, all time record. And during his speech, he was being roundly ridiculed and mocked by Democrats uh, tweeting real time uh, and um, and McCarthy was was equally vicious in his attacks. I thought, you know, in the last 24 hours, that really validates everything that Larry and I have been saying all week that we're at a new low in um, civility, uh, collegiality, bipartisanship. Now, I think part of the question was great question, by the way, but I think part of it was, well, is there any of it going on? Yes, there's some, and there's some people of goodwill on both sides who would like to see uh, civility return and bipartisanship return. Uh, it, I, I'm as much as I want to see it happen, and I know that there are people who want it to happen. I think Donald Trump is so poisoned uh, that that if you if you're viewed as talking to the other side, you're viewed as compromising with the other side. If you're if you're viewed with as co-sponsoring co legislation, then you must be a traitor to the cause. And uh, even Republicans who would like to and have a history of working in a bipartisan manner are afraid to do so uh, in the current political environment. Yeah, I think Tim's right. I, I mean, it's at an all time low. And I, I think the, during the earlier discussion on uh, domestic um, issues, uh, Dr. Anderson, I thought, think uh, framed it pretty well. And, and uh, it's just at a dismal level. Um, now, the, the infrastructure bill is uh, was bipartisan. 19 senators voted for it and 13 House members. Um, it seems like the anger from the far right and, and uh, maybe the Trump camp is uh, being directed at the House members. Uh, but uh, 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 Mitch McConnell, who also freed up his caucus to vote as they wanted on that thing, is being a target as well. 
So um, bipartisanship is in uh, uh, really tough shape. Um, I think, as we all know, there's nothing wrong with partisanship. I think we should all, I'm a partisan. I've been, and Tim's a bit of a partisan. We've been discussing that, but doing it civilly all week. Now it's beginning to be um, uh, dehumanizing in, in, in terms of the, the way that societies look at each other. And uh, uh, they're using dangerous language. And um, as I sort of looked at the history of what's going on in politics is that it, the, the negative ads at the end of the campaign used to use really bad language and, and uh, very tough stuff and the way they described uh, the opponent. Now it's being sort of part of the, the, the vernacular by other by members against members. So it, it, the tone has really gotten bad. And um, um, you had a good discussion about except, exceptionalism and, and what that means. But Anyway, um, at this point in time, things are pretty tough. Uh, another um, colleague, uh, Peter Finn, can we get Peter Finn up, um, has asked a question which kind of throws this uh, into the future. Uh, Peter, would you like to unmute and ask your question? Hi. Yeah. So can you hear me? Yes. Perhaps. Oh, hi. Thanks, Phil. Um, so I just wondered, and it's in a similar vein, really, to the previous question, um, but kind of projecting forward into the future. Can you imagine kind of the people who are working in, who are elected in the House and the Senate now in 15, 20 years time, working together in a similar way, obviously with different views, but working together in some sense? Or is the animosity so huge um, that it's just it's just not going to be possible? Thanks. Well, I have an opinion on that. You want to go first? Uh, I'll jump in and try and be short so you can uh, uh, carry on. Um, the geographical shift in, in politics, uh, Tim uh, made a really good point uh, in talking about the shift in Arkansas, for example, from blue to, to red. I mean, we've seen that shift all over the country. And, and uh, uh, when I was in the House from Idaho, um, uh, there were two Democratic members of the House. And uh, we filled both seats, and uh, uh, now all seats are, are red. So anyway, we've had this dramatic shift, and it's come up that it's just closely divided in the United States, and um, it's the way it is. House and the Senate. So it's and, and we've hollowed out the middle, uh, so that moderates like myself uh, can't. You know, the, there's no lubrication uh, in the. Uh, 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 system for people to talk across the aisle anymore. So um, uh, I don't know where it's going, but we are where we are at the moment uh, in, in, in this hyper anti-establishment uh, period when Donald Trump came along and uh, uh, nobody expected him to win, including himself. And uh, he's in and uh, we're left with this and uh, hopefully we can survive. I, I'm worried, by the way, about our democracy. So as you look ahead, as I as I understand the question, looking over the next 20 to 30 years, can, can we anticipate, can we look forward to a return to civility and collegiality and bipartisanship? And <clears throat> first of all, 20, 30 years is a long time. If you look back the last 20 years, we almost have a whole new Congress. We used to, we used to talk a lot about in the United States about having term limits. Uh, we don't need term limits, I don't think. We, we have seen a big turnover both in the House and Senate. So I would expect in the next 20 to 30 years, you're going to have a whole new group of people. Uh, and, and that might maybe that's maybe that's what we need. But let's assume that these these people that we have now, can they could they return to bipartisanship? There's a lot of them that they would like to. Uh, I've talked to them and, and many of them. And, and they will say I'm, that they are responding to what their constituents want, which is on the Republican side, anger, meanness. Uh, I had a senator, won't mention what state he's from or what his name is, but he said, I, I go back, I want a reason. I want to logically talk with constituents about issues that we're facing. And they say, you're not tough enough. You're not mean enough. You're not angry enough. But that's what they're wanting. So the return to what 
I would like to see in the Congress, it will require a change among the attitudes of the American people. I think the, 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 the ugly meanness that we see in Washington is a reflection of the anger that exists right now uh, amongst the American people. So that's what I think would have to happen. And uh, maybe at some point there will be a, a backlash, a repudiation of the kind of anger that's fueling our politics to a great extent on both sides, but particularly the Republican side. Um, I, this question clearly um, is one uh, close to the hearts of our audience since uh, uh, we've had two or three more questions, basically reflecting the same kinds of comments. But uh, uh, Emma Long, uh, who tells me her mic isn't working, um, has asked a very similar question in, in terms of, you know, are there ways of returning to uh, a more bipartisan uh, approach uh, with, with uh, uh, away from the strong uh, partisanship, strong and perhaps rather brutal partisanship that's developed. Um, uh, you may feel we've covered all the comments, but uh, given that it, do it really does seem to you know, exercise our audience. A few years ago, I remember uh, Senator Lamar Alexander from the great state of Tennessee Lamar was probably the most overqualified member of the United States Senate. He had been the president of a university. He had been secretary of education. He, he was a, a brilliant guy. But I remember him talking to the Republican senators. And he, well, it wasn't just Republicans to both sides. And he said, you know, we come up here and on Tuesdays, the Democrats go over and have their luncheon and the Republicans go over and have their luncheon and they talk among themselves. And on Wednesdays, the Democrats go over and have their lunch and the Republicans go over and have their lunch and we both get in our huddles and we decide how we can beat up on the other side. And he went on, he said, maybe we ought to get together and have lunch together and figure out how we can work together. So he started a bipartisan uh, luncheon, breakfast, I think it actually was. He had about a dozen people coming. You know what happened? It faded away till nobody was coming. And then Lamar decided, I've had enough, I'm going to retire. Uh, there are efforts like that, that that happen. There's a group in the House um, called the Problem Solvers Caucus, bipartisan, trying to come to the middle. Um, I go to the Senate prayer breakfast where there are about 20 senators, and I know that they are goodwill, both good hearts on both sides who would like to work together. And that's an effort. And, and maybe that's going to be the one area in which we actually do find some, some common ground. Uh, but it's very tough. And it seems like most members on both sides would rather fight as talk. <laughs> yeah, I have, I have a, a, a thought there too. And it was discussed earlier in the, uh, this forum about uh, the role of a crisis, for example. And I would think that that would be the worst uh, reason to, for people to come together, but it could bond uh, people. Um, uh, that would be a shame if, if that were the case. Um, and Tim is suggesting uh, things that have happened in the past, like gangs, like sometimes you, uh, if you follow American politics, which a lot of people do on this call or everybody, you know, you have the gang of six, the gang of 12, the gang of 14, and it's generally made up of uh, equal number of Democrats, and Republicans that are sort of going against leadership that are trying to, uh, uh, you know, uh, promote and, and continue this um, polarization. And they're trying to break through and Tim just mentioned some efforts to break through, and, and it could be that the, there could be a breakthrough where people are just tired of it, and maybe it'll just have to be the right mix. I'd like to uh, enter into the discussion the role of uh, consultants in some of this. It's that sometimes, you know, you go to Congress, you want to do the right thing. Uh, uh, it's your background, it's your religious upbringing, whatever it is. You, you want to reach across the aisle, and people will say, no, you can't do that. You won't get elected, reelected. You can't be too nice. You can't uh, a reason. 
Um, uh, it was mentioned earlier, the retreat from reason. Well, the, the Lamar Alexander is a perfect example of that. But where does all of this come from? Sometimes the consultants are there, the pollsters and so forth. Instead of people just plain old working it out. Um, the last thing I'll say on this point is that the, there was a really good example of this. Tim, you, I think you must have been part of this when uh, during the Clinton impeachment, I think you were there and everybody retreated to the old chamber. Right. Yes, I was there. And 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 if it, help me out, if I, I'm going to describe it, and then you correct okay. me. But everybody wanted to go in there because you had to figure out some rules and what was going to go on. But you wanted to do it without press, without staff, and you wanted to talk to each other. You were in the room. And right. It was uh, it was a pretty amazing meeting because uh, there had not been an impeachment trial in the U.S. Senate for I think over a hundred years at that point. And no one knew exactly how to proceed with a trial, except everybody felt we didn't want to what we thought was drag uh, the Senate through the mud, like what had happened in the House with uh, the sexual allegations and all of the tawdry details. So they're trying to figure out how to move forward. So they called a meeting in the old Senate chamber, which goes back pre-Civil War. Um, and there they allowed no press and no staff, just senators. And I'll always remember it because uh, Ted Kennedy, liberal senator from Massachusetts stood up and made a suggestion on how we proceed. Uh, essentially, there'd be a truncated trial and there'd be no only a very limited number of live witnesses on the floor of the Senate and Monica Lewinsky would not be called to the floor of the Senate and so forth. Phil Graham, who at that time was probably the most conservative U.S. senator from the state of Texas, he stood up and he said, I think Senator Kennedy is on to a good idea. And from there, of course, we joked about it later and said this was the spirit of the Senate that had come in and taken over and taken control. But there was a bipartisan agreement that came out of that meeting uh, that, that led to you know, a, a, a civil way of proceeding. That's pretty rare, but we need more of it. Well, maybe it's a spirit that needs to be captured or, or yeah. uh, it was doing it together. Yeah, exactly right. As human beings and senators and uh, devoted public servants. Um, yes, and continuing slightly in a, in a different way, but uh, still in this area, uh, Liz Grant, can we get Liz Grant back? Um, has a suggestion of a potential Long, she says, long shot way forward. Liz, do you want to say it? Ah, uh, Liz, we're still not getting your sound. Okay, uh, um, so <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, but basically, Liz uh, has asked, you know, is there any possibility of in this uh, in, in this confrontational political world that has developed uh, that uh, a third party? candidate um, might mobilize cooperation. We've been asked that a few times this week too. It's a very good question. Uh, <clears throat> I'll just say this. I hear more about um, leaving the people, leaving the Republican Party and becoming independents and <clears throat> talking about the need for <clears throat> a third party than I have in many years. That said, uh, it is very, very difficult to create a third party and make it viable in the United States. It, the two-party system is so ingrained into our tradition, and we've had periodic efforts of starting a third party. Um, uh, uh, Ross Perot being one of the ones back in the 90s who did better. He ended up getting in. He, for a while, he was running second, then he dropped to third and ended up not being a, a, a huge uh, contender. <clears throat> it is, um, but, but then his party faded away. And I can think of, uh, what is his name? Anderson, who had a, John Anderson, a serious third party effort as a moderate in the, in the middle. But the, normally in the United States, when a third party emerges, whatever it is that is strong enough to attract significant attention ends up being absorbed by one of the two major parties and the third party melts away. And, and uh, so while we've never had uh, an environment quite like this, and maybe 
it will take this for, uh, I, I'm pretty skeptical that a third party could develop uh, that would that would uh, seriously challenge e either of the two major parties. I agree with that. I, I don't see it coming, um, but I find it interesting that more people are talking about it. And the reason that more people are talking about it is because they want to see some way out of this. And um, that that's, uh, uh, you know, it, a suggestion. And some people say, well, let, let's break the logjam in Congress. We need term limits. They come up with solutions that may not get uh, be, be placed into effect, but but they're looking for some way out of this. They're hungering for it. Um, I, you know, I don't know if we're going to have defections from Republicans to Democrats, Republicans to independents. I mean, we've got two independents in the Senate now, um, but I don't see a, a viable third party uh, coming together. One of the reasons on the Democratic side is because uh, Ralph Nader, uh, you know, uh, messed up the election for the Democrats in 2000, for goodness sake. And, and so if you lose uh, a, a part of a, po a possible coalition, if you will, within the party, uh, you could end up losing the, the whole uh, the, the whole uh, the power in the government like we did in 2000. And, uh, and I'm sure the Republicans are afraid of that. They've embraced quite a few people. Uh, uh, they're the third largest county in my state uh, a few weeks ago endorsed uh, the, the Republican Central Committee endorsed the John Birch Society, for goodness sake. John Birch Society, they used to be so fringy and hit under rocks. Now they've been embraced by the Republicans. They've gone mainstream. They're gone mainstream. <laughs> yeah. I, I ended up. A couple of colleagues that uh, very dear friends. One of them was the chief of staff for a prominent Democratic senator, and he's frustrated with the Democratic Party because he thinks they are uh, fiscally irresponsible, and that we'd better get serious about our deficit spending and the growth of our national debt if we're going to save our country. Well, I feel the same way, and he he, he and I will talk, and he'll say. Maybe we need a third party. You and me, third party. Will there people feel just like us? Let's build a third party around this idea of fiscal sanity. And then we keep talking. And he's a Democrat and I'm a Republican and we differ on so many issues. You could, you could never find enough consensus. And I think that's, that's the problem in forming a third party in the United States is that they, Americans tend to gravitate to the to the to their corners on the two major parties. Yeah. Of course, we've seen things like the Lincoln Project, which is not a third party uh, phenomenon. It was just created by a lot of Republicans who wanted to defeat um, uh, Trump, and they said, uh, in this case, we should vote Democratic. But uh, they, if if Trump disappeared from the scene, uh, they may be back in trying to build. Uh, re rebuild uh, the Republican Party. Liz Cheney says she's a Republican. She's not bolting, but uh, she's got an uphill battle to, to defeat uh, 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 Trump. Um, she's just been kicked out of the Republican Party in Wyoming, for goodness sake. So uh, there's a lot course, going on. Of course, one of, the, one of the problems for third parties, minor parties, whatever you like, in, in the States, is that the two major parties uh, have in the past anyway been varied enough and extensive enough that they have if, if a third party has shown any uh, likelihood of success they've extended the tent if you like uh, over those and brought them in or, or at least brought enough of them in to 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 take away uh, the third party's dynamic um, and I, maybe that's still happening but what you've got now is within the major parties uh, whereas previously my feeling is that on the whole those who were brought in then uh, kind of centralized their opinions and they moved towards the party uh, now you've got a situation where uh, the parties have still got these uh, people who might otherwise be in third parties but they are remaining strong in their opinion they're not coming towards the party center if anything they're dragging it away so uh, whether it's um bobert or green or cawthorn or somewhere like somebody on like that or whether it's uh, aoc or or bernie or, or whatever on the other side um 
that they are these groups within the party seem possibly to be more problematic now than they were or am i just misunderstanding no i think you're you're totally right but uh, you know we've got like on the arkansas ballot for president we'll have the green party we'll have the libertarian party we've got a number of parties that are actually on the ballot where people have options but in the end voters tend to say i don't want to throw my vote away i know that person's not going to win they'll end up voting for one of the two major candidates the other problem that a third party has is is getting ballot access while because the republicans and democrats so control the election process that they can oftentimes squeeze out it's tough to get even a line on the ballot am i right yeah 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 you know i mean uh there have been uh ideas proposed like ranked choice uh voting um which uh if you had a very safe seat say a republican seat and then you had a third party who got uh uh, the second uh, highest, uh, uh, you know, amount of votes. It might give that person, that candidate, a, a launching pad for something, and and then maybe the uh, uh, the other candidate could, uh, you know, step on his or her toe and falter and have some scandal come up at the last minute or something, and then you you might get somebody in there. But uh, rank choice or or these guerrilla uh, primaries that the, the, they have in some states are. Jungle. Uh, jungle. Th thank you. Thank you for cracking my, uh, my zoo uh, 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 vocabulary, which was a very good jungle program. Yeah. Um, uh, that, that's something that could happen. Uh, well, uh, surprisingly, uh, to, to me anyway, we've got this far without talking about Trump in this hour. Um, Peter Gordon, is Peter Gordon still around? He, uh, he put in a question a while ago um, that involved Trump. Um, yeah, let me just un unmute myself. Um, yes. The question really is, you've got um, the two parties. If you look at the GOP, that's very much dominated by the Trump faction. If you want to um, stand in the primary, you've really got to be a Trump supporter. If you look at the Democrats, that's interesting because you've got the different wings. You've got the uh, Sanders and the Warren wing, and you've got the, the if you like, um, the, the more the more centrist people. How do the two of you see the two parties um, uh, going? Is it likely that there might be some change of control, some other part, some other faction becoming um, uh, dominant in the parties in the in, in, in the short term? Or is that some way off? Do you want to? Yeah, that? I mean, I'll take a shot at it. I, um, um, it all this week, uh, I've been trying to make the point that. Uh, uh, the Democratic caucus is pretty broad. I mean, it's much broader than AOC and, and uh, uh, the, the squad and so forth. There are, uh, in 2018, there are a lot of moderate candidates that were successful and people with extraordinary backgrounds in uh, public service and national defense and, and intelligence and, um, and, and, and uh, a history of uh, serving and uh, uh, other bodies and so forth. So, so what's happening in today's world is that uh, uh, if you're on, uh, you know, the cable networks, you get a lot of attention, and then you sort of uh, define the party. Um, I think Pelosi's done a good job of, of trying to work with everybody and, and say uh, compromise is not a dirty word. Let's get the job done and, and get this over the goal line for the president. Otherwise, uh, it. it their goal of maintaining the majority is really going to be out the window. Um, so that's one thing. I, I think the um, if you look at the age of the leadership in the House, for example, uh, uh, I think everybody's uh, either close to 80 or over 80. Certainly, Steny and, and Nancy are, are, uh, are, are over, Nancy Pelosi and Steny Hoyer are over 80. So there's going to be a change in leadership in the House, and there's going to be Probably a knockdown, drag out fight on that. Um, uh, Jeffries from, uh, I guess, New York has got uh, uh, you know a coveted position in leadership right now. But I think uh, PayPal and uh, from uh, the state of Washington, who's leading the uh, the Progressive Caucus, is is actually running for for speaker now. So um, you see that leadership in the House. Um, uh, Schumer can even get a challenge uh, in his primary and. Um, um, I, I, I look to leaders like uh, Dick Durbin, for example, from Illinois. I think he's a fantastic leader. That, and uh, uh, Schumer will get credit for a lot of things he's done. Um, but 
we'll have to see if there's this turnover. Uh, there's uh, people are going to be frustrated. I mean, especially when when if the the Democrats uh, lose their majorities in the in the House and the Senate, both are in danger right now. And uh, um, so we'll see. Peter, you have correctly uh, stated that uh, Donald Trump is firmly in control of the Republican Party. He controls it from the Republican National Committee to both uh, uh, the House and Senate election committees. He controls right down to the county committees as we've, and the state committees, as we saw in Wyoming, and how they've gone after uh, Liz Cheney. He's firmly in control. And probably more significantly is the polls indicate that the vast majority of Republicans, 75, 80% of Republicans would prefer number one, that Donald Trump run for president and uh, they would indicate their support for him. <clears throat> so what's the future of the Republican party? Uh, Republic, a lot of Republicans would like to see Donald Trump just fade away. Uh, and let a new generation of leadership, perhaps it, more in the traditional Republican mold, smaller government, individual rights, liberty, uh, the, the traditional positions that are attracted into the Republican Party, they'd like to see that restored. But as long as Donald Trump is exerting his influence, I, I can't see that he's not going to have an iron hold, an iron grip on the on the party uh, and it, every indication he's making is he's gonna run uh, for president again. <clears throat> if he does, <clears throat> I can't, <clears throat> excuse me, I can't see any Republican on the horizon that could in any way challenge him. Uh, he'll have primary opponents, but but none of them can will, will be able to uh, take it, knock him off his throne. So he'd be the nominee of the party and depending upon who the Democrats nominate, whether Biden runs again, uh, <clears throat> Donald Trump could win. He could be president again. So it's it's very uncertain what the future of the Republican Party is going to be, what it's going to look like. Uh, and and beyond conjecture, I, I don't know what direction it's going to go. Uh, folks who think like me that are in elected office, they kind of keep their mouths shut because they're afraid they're going to lose their seat. They're going to lose a primary. They're going to get targeted by President Trump, um, I, I joke about the emails that I get because I get all of these mass produced emails asking for money for the, from the Trump organization. But we, we kind of laughed at one I got this week and because I never I, have, I never responded to any of them. And this one said, uh, Tim, what's happened to you? Have the libs grabbed you? And that's kind of the way they uh, keep uh, keep a grip on. Larry's trying to pull me over. <laughs> you know, one thing that I liked about the earlier discussion was uh, uh, the fact that there was a there was um, a, a, a talk about what's going on with these issues that are not really issues. I mean, critical race theory is not really an issue, and uh, uh, you know, the manufactured issues, but they're, they're being promoted and, and, and uh, really stirring up the population. To, to answer this question, how we can get back, maybe, maybe there's an issue out there, uh, not a crisis, but just an issue that's going to bring parts of both uh, sides together that they just simply want to work on. I don't know what it is at the, at the moment. I mean, I would hope that it would be climate change. Maybe maybe there could be a climate change coalition or something. But um, uh, the, it, it, to deal with fact and, and to deal with science and to deal with the real issues that are affecting people's lives today, instead of trying to just win for, for winning sake, uh, um, Maybe that sounds naive. And maybe it's well, the, during the Trump years, there was one issue that that garnered a lot of bipartisan support, and that was criminal justice reform. Yes. Uh, and Van Jones, a very liberal Democrat, African-American, was willing to work with uh, some folks in the Trump administration who believed in criminal. I don't know how much the president believed in it, but there were people around him who believed in criminal justice reform. And the First Step Act was the result. It was a totally bipartisan effort. And that, that's where you see an issue that brought them together. But then once it passed, it was, it was, that was the end of the moment. 
Um, we, we're very close to the end here, and I see Cara's got a question out there, uh, which reflects on your experience. And I think the answer for your experience and the answer for the contemporary Congress uh, would be quite different. Cara, do you want to come in and uh, ask that question? Yes, thanks, Phil. Um, hello, gentlemen. Um, I was wondering about how you decided uh, on the division of your time between when you were in the House, between your home district and spending time in Washington. What were the kind of motivations that made you choose? And also then, Tim, did, w was that different between when you were serving as a congressman and as a senator? Um, <clears throat> I tried to do it all, and, and it's impossible. But um, I wanted to have an impact on big issues, so I got very involved in welfare reform. I wanted to be a constituent congressman, so I was back every weekend. Uh, I flew back to Arkansas every week. Didn't have to go as far as Idaho, but it was still a long flight, and um, it hurt my family. It was it was a tough life, um, and I was trying to do it all. I got to the Senate; it didn't really change much. The, we stayed in Washington more. Our weeks were longer in D.C. Um, but I still try to get back to Arkansas every weekend. And it's, um, it's I, the expectations are very high in the day in which we live. Uh, people expect you to be back. They want you holding town meetings. They want you available for local civic activities. And yet you have all the demands in Washington, D.C. So uh, that's what when we, we talked to the young people this week about a lot of them wanted to work to considering public service and running for office. And, and we encourage that, but, but I said, be sure you count the cost and realize there is a real price to pay. So I, I tried to do it all. Yeah. When I generally talk to people, whatever the audience is about <clears throat> the house, I, I say there are safe seats and there are um, marginal seats and, and, uh, um, and I had one of those swing seats, the, the swing district. I, I was the first Democrat in 25 years to win the seat. So I won with 53%. Um, generally, if you win with over 55%, it's regarded as being somewhat safe. But I knew that district and I, I, I was lucky enough to win it. I worked hard. I think I, uh, you know, deserved to win it. But I was still in a swing district, so I was home all the time. So that was a, a factor. Um, people in swing districts have to go home more often and raise more money. And uh, actually, it puts them in touch with their district because it would uh, probably uh, encourage you to move across the aisle. Um, so I did that. Um, the average, uh, I went home about 30 times a year. And uh, um uh, my district was as big as the state of Indiana. It was 500 miles long. When I landed in Boise, I, I had I had two airports that I could land in in my district. There was no direct flight. Um, and uh, Chris, uh, who's here with me tonight, could not go home every weekend because I'd be home Thursday, work until Monday, and, and then hit the ground running when I got back to D.C. It was a grueling thing, but it was because it was a swing district. And... Um, uh, paid off for the first term. I got 58% of the vote, my reelection, but then we hit the Clinton buzzsaw in, in uh, 94, and it didn't matter how much I delivered and yeah. everything. So, um, <clears throat> so you just work hard, and uh, it did cause me to reach across the aisle. And and, uh, and, and Tim mentioned the pro people. I think the pro people kind of in 92 really liked the fact that I was trying to work for a balanced budget, no gimmicks. I was really trying to cut the budget. And um, I ran 30 points ahead of Clinton in 92 in my district. And uh, so that was a motivation car. I, I appreciate the, the question because it, a lot of political calculations go into how often you go home. And uh, I know people who had safe seats. They, they, they only had to raise about hundred thousand dollars just to put something up in the air. I had to raise, you know, 700,000 in my first re-election. And I better get a lot in the bank, you know, the, the, to scare people off. That actually brings us to uh, one last question from Richard Johnson, then we'll finish the session, I think. But it ties in so neatly that I couldn't avoid it. Um, 
Richard's uh, asked, uh, when you were in Congress, how much of your time each week did you spend raising money for your re-election? And were there aspects of fundraising that you enjoyed, or was it just a chore? It was a chore. I hated it. And, uh, <clears throat> it, it, you know, even if, if you're in a safe district, you may not have to raise as much money for re-election. But the parties now put so much pressure on you to raise for the Congressional Committee or the Senate Committee. They give you quotas and they want you on that phone raising money for the party. And they put a lot of pressure on that. They'll say you're not going to get a prime committee assignment if you don't raise a certain amount of money. There are members. I hated it. So I avoided a lot of the phone calls. But my my uh, campaign staff would give me a list maybe 50 names and who they're with and maybe a little note about their background. And I would sit there and call dialing for dollars. That's what they call it. Dialing for dollars. We don't dial anymore, but that's what we call it anyway. But I absolutely hated it. And I think most members of Congress hate it. Very few find anything enjoyable about it. Some are a lot better at it than others. Schumer is probably the best there is in the business at dialing for dollars but uh, it's one of the very unpleasant, undesirable parts of American politics. I didn't like it at all. I didn't do much of the, the dialing, uh, but we always had sort of innovative fundraisers. I had a river trip in Idaho every year and uh, I'd get people on the river and we'd spend two days. Uh, that sounds like fun. It was fun. That was, so that was <laughs> the most fun. And uh, I had some people that came out at all four years. They still talk about it and said it was the best trip. It was on the lower Salmon River, and uh, it was just a kick. We had a lot of wild rabbits in there. Um, I also uh, was able to cut across a lot of different constituencies. I, I was on the Banking Committee and the Natural Resources Committee, and, and uh, I'd, I'd have a fundraiser, and there'd be bankers from J.P. Morgan. There'd be people from the Sierra Club. There'd be somebody from the Carpenters Union, and they're all looking around going, what are we all doing here? You know, and I. Uh, uh, and we assume from this that you enjoyed fundraising. Well, we always had a good breakfast at um, <laughs> Colleen in the morning. We had a good system. And uh, I didn't enjoy it that much, though. And uh, 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 the members hate it. They, they, they hate it. And uh, it, there's a lot of money in politics. So, uh. Gentlemen. Thank you very much. Uh, I really enjoyed uh, all of our um, sessions together this week, very much indeed. And I am absolutely positive that our audiences have shared that feeling. Um, and uh, I will pass it back to Andy and Cara. Thanks, Phil. Thank you, Phil. Can I just say um, thanks to the esteemed members of Congress um, for making this event uh, just finishing it off in, in absolutely great style um, and for committing your time to, to this. Uh, it's been great. Great to hear your insights. But also thanks to, to Phil Davis, my co-chair as the APG. You know, Phil Davis is is Mr. American Studies in the UK. You know, nothing happens with American Studies without Phil knowing about it. And, you know, he's been a, uh, you know, a, an amazing servant to American Studies in the UK for, for you know, a huge number of years. I'm not going to say how many, Phil, but a long, a long, long time. And then finally, thanks to Cara as well, because you know this, you know, this event wouldn't happen without Cara. She's the, she's the brains behind it. You know, she's there organising the the IT and you know putting all this together. She's both got a hat on as the, you know the deputy at the Echo Centre, but also she's chair of the British Association of American Studies as well. So she's the natural follower to Phil as Mrs. American Studies coming up definitely and just really lucky to have you both and I thank you both for your for your input and your time and your support so and also just finally thanks to all the other panelists and to the chairs who've made this event possible so thank you. Cara don't you want to well, thank you so much, uh, Andy, and, and I echo your thanks to, uh, to all our fellow organisers and to our sponsors. I'd like to say particularly a big thanks to the US Embassy, who um, support the Congress to Campus programme, which has brought Larry and Tim uh, to the UK this week, um, and also uh, to the US Association of Former Members of Congress, which both Tim and Larry work very, uh, very closely with and give their time very generously to. Um, so I just want to say thank you so much to all our, um, our delegates as well, everyone who's come along today. To, to listen to our audience. Uh, thank you for, for vocalizing your questions and thank you for just typing them uh, when technology was, uh, was beyond us. Uh, it's been really lovely to um, 
hear such a stimulating discussion this afternoon. And um, all it remains is to is me to wish everybody a very uh, happy weekend. So um, we're going to depart now. Thank you so much and uh, see you soon. Bye bye. Thank you.